Hey guys, over the last couple of years, I've had loads of people ask me how they can support the show, and now you can. So if you like this show and you want to support it and you want to keep it free, head on over to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash support. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash support. Thanks for all you do. If you're a business owner and you want to increase your cash flow, or if you're a label or artist and you want to promote new music, then listen up. For information about advertising on Everyone Loves Guitar, including information on geographically targeted ads, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Hey guys, I got to tell you a quick story. I recently put in a pair of EMG pickups into my Les Paul Classic and tinkering with electronics, wires, not my bag. That being said, a little over an hour later, I'd install the pickups with literally no problems at all. And the quality of the sound is absolutely amazing. I put in the retroactive Fat 55s. That's a new set that they have. And that's because I wanted a vintage, you know, British brown sound. And these Fat 55s are modeled after the tone of the classic PAFs which is exactly what I got. The thing I wasn't expecting is it sort of feels like my volume and tone knobs have been expanded to 20. There's like a lot more responsiveness in the volume and tone, and I could even get harmonics now at low volumes on the neck pickup, and any preconceived notions I had about installation being difficult or, you know, there's a problem having a battery in there were totally wrong. The the battery thing, it's like putting a battery in one of my kids' toys when they were little children growing up. It's just a total non-issue. And in fact, I'm going to wind up getting the Strat set next because installation for that is even easier because it comes with the pick guard and the, the uh, pickup's already attached to the pick guard. And if you want to check out EMGs for yourself, now is actually a great time to do this because Rob and Allison are making making a special offer available for listeners of this show only. And and here it is. For a limited time, head on over to emgpickups.com, buy one or more sets of pickups, and enter ELG in the discount code section of the shopping cart. ELG, of course, for Everyone Loves Guitar. And they're going to give you 15% off, which is huge. The biggest discounts they ever give is 10%. Plus, they're going to give away $70 worth of free bonuses, including an EMG cinch bag, a pick tin, lanyard, stickers, and a t-shirt. Plus, you get a money-back guarantee if you're not 100% satisfied. Plus, not a two-year performance guarantee on the performance of the actual pickups themselves, but a lifetime performance guarantee. And on top of everything else, you're going to get free shipping. So there's basically no risk at all here for you to try a set or two of EMG pickups. And the great thing about these pickups is, and I got two sets, once you install them, and by the way, there's no soldering involved at all, because I couldn't have done it if there was, quite frankly. But once you do install them, all you need to do to swap them out and put another set in is literally disconnect one wire on each pickup, and then you're done. That's it. It's kind of like putting Legos together. It's that easy. So go to emgpickups.com, enter ELG in the shopping cart for your discount code, and that's it. You get to take advantage of this offer right now. Man, this one's always a big challenge. If you want to buy or sell a home or investment property and you're here in the Tampa Bay area, in Hillsborough, Pinellas, or Pasco counties, then listen up. West Florida Real Estate is a local residential real estate broker that's helped over 250 Bay Area homeowners buy and sell their properties in the last four years alone. If you're looking to sell, you'll want to get their free report, the seven biggest mistakes homeowners make when hiring a realtor. And if you're looking to buy a property, you definitely want to get your hands on the 21 most expensive mistakes Tampa home buyers make when buying a home. Each one of these reports is going to save you time and money. Inside, you'll discover the seven most important things to consider when hiring a realtor, what to do if you're buying and selling a home at the same time, and the danger of choosing a realtor who agrees with everything you say. To get your hands on these free reports, head on over to westfloridarealestate.com. That's westfloridarealestate.com. The Be Fulfilled Journal helps you be more honest with yourself and with others and be more open to handling things you've avoided dealing with for years. It's a 12-week online and journal program that helps you identify and eliminate things you do that are causing you stress and live in more gratitude and joy. 
It was actually developed by a long-term friend of mine who got sober in 2008, and he's put together a great deal just for my listeners. You get the 300-page hardcover journal and access to the 12-week video program online, plus free shipping, plus membership in a private Facebook support group with others going through the program, plus a five-day mini course showing you how to let go of stuff that's draining your energy, plus a 30-day 100% money-back guarantee. To start your journey and get all the bonuses, go to BeFulfilledJournal.com forward slash ELG. That's BeFulfilledJournal.com forward slash ELG. Hey guys, just want to give you a heads up. We've got a great interview coming up. John Ferraro, one of the most successful drummers on the L.A. scene, been out with Larry Carlton on and off for 18 years, just had a tremendous storied career. Man, I hate to say this, uh, his side of the audio was a little muffled. We are done pretty much with Skype. I've been testing a couple of other systems that you're going to start seeing me roll out, probably Zoom. It seems really clean. Uh, at least for now, but uh, I apologize. Please don't let that dissuade you. John is a great guy. There's some great stories in here about working with Larry Carlton, working with Ron Wood, Rod Stewart, George Benson. I mean, he's he's seen and, and literally seen and done it all, and he's a great guy and as grounded as he comes. He's got a lot of um, really good experience with doing uh, some side hustles, sync, and all that stuff. So pay attention. Again, just grin and bear it. I appreciate your patience and know that I'm working hard to get a build a better mousetrap for all of us see you on the inside hey everybody this is craig garber welcome to everyone loves guitar and uh we're going to give some love to the rhythm section today i've got one of the greatest and uh, most successful la session players around with us with the one and only john ferraro he, he's a super cool guy and he's got a great really interesting background i just want to give a shout out to uh stevie d steve de stanislaw for yes. hooking us up thanks steve uh, John's a killer drummer. He's enjoyed a real and is still enjoying a really busy career playing and touring with some of the biggest names in the music industry. He was born in Waterbury, Connecticut to a trumpet playing dad and piano playing mom. Started playing drums at age five. His early idols and influences include Ginger Baker. I love that guy. John Bonham, Joe Morello, Buddy Rich, Ringo Starr, Charlie Watts, and Tony Williams. God, what a selection of drummers there, man. When John was 11 <laughs> years old, right? I mean, Charlie Watts doesn't get better yeah. than that. Uh, Buddy Rich, you're not as angry as Buddy, though, I don't think. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> when John was 11 years old, his family moved out to Southern California where he started his drumming career. He attended Orange Coast College and Cal State Long Beach where he majored in business administration. He also took performance classes. Got his first professional gig at Disneyland for the newly opened Space Mountain attraction where he worked for four years. He also performed for a local band called Storyville during those years. He toured domestically and internationally with Larry Carlton on and off for 18 years. That's longer than most marriages, John. You know that. That's, that's true. Yeah, I know. Uh, he also toured the globe with Barry Manilow's World Tour and enjoyed playing for Biff Baby's All Stars, which is a loose aggregate of top flight jamming buddies formed by Sterling Biff Ball, who is, of course, vice president of Ernie Ball Company. John's had the pleasure of working with other notable artists like Ron Wood, Rod Stewart, George Benson, Debbie Boone, Vicky Carr, Robin Ford, Jay Graydon, Abel Boreal, S senior, uh, senior, I'm assuming, right? dad is the basis yes yeah yeah, yeah. yes yeah um yeah, albert, bass player. Yeah. albert lee steve lukather from toto who was on the show uh boz skagg steve morse who was on our show aaron neville linda ronstadt michael sembello umberto tazzi eddie mm -hmm. van halen carl verheyen who is on the show kirk whalem tim weisberg tak matsumoto from bees mike love from the beach boys and loads more i literally had to cut out like 30 or 40 names and that was still just a you know a hair on the elephant's back oh, okay uh too much tack and <laughs> no no it's because you've had such a great career yeah. man tack and larry carlton's instrumental album take your pick which john toured on won the grammy for best pop instrumental album at the 53rd grammy awards he also has a co-producer credit for the mutual admiration society's debut album that's another super group of of uh session guys from LA and we'll talk about that afterwards and he's featured as a musician on there again that's Sterling Ball from Ernie Ball's 
latest venture. John's resume also sports a wide range of studio work. He's played for Promise Keepers Men's Christian Ministry at live stadium worship concerts, and he recorded on all their records. Also performs as a session player for session musician for film, television shows, and commercials. Again, massive credits, but uh, just to mention some include tracks for the Bronx Zoo. All right, represent ESPN, The Gambler, <laughs> Star. That's a great zoo, man. Star yeah. Search might be the best. Might be the uh, the diamond of the whole Bronx, actually. Uh, oh, Star Search, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Rolling Vengeance, The Young and the Restless, The Warriors, one of my favorite movies, uh, Acura, Budweiser, Honda, McDonald's, Miller Beer, Nissan, right. and loads more. He also performed for the 2001 and 2 critically acclaimed Lion King at the pa- Pantages. Did I get that right? Uh, Pantages, yeah. Pantages, Pantages Theater yeah. in Hollywood. Thank yeah. you. And he kept the beat yeah. for NBC's Frasier for nearly 10 years. He was recently featured in the films Anchorman 2, Casa de Mi Padre, Action Point, and many other Hollywood and indie hits. He's been working currently with living legend, singer, and songwriter, 91 years young, Bert Bacharach, for the past seven years touring Europe, Asia, North, and South America. And he's going to be out through uh, throughout Europe and Lond- uh, London, Ireland, Germany throughout this summer. John, I'm exhausted, man. Thank you so much for coming. I know. You need a break. (laughs) (laughs) What a career, man. Yeah, it's it's just keeps going. I'm very fortunate and blessed to be able to, you know, do something that I've always loved to do and work with these tremendous people. So I'm so happy for you, man. And thank you so much for your time. Thanks for coming up on the show. Um, great to be here. Yeah. You grew up in a musical family. Were your parents hobbyists or professionals? Yeah, both of them. My dad played trumpet and the mom is still alive. you know, big fans of, of live music and jazz. And, uh, uh, my mom, more of a classical type player. Uh, and my dad, I think, you know, played jazz trumpet. He had, uh, some of the older style trumpet players. So we would hear some of that music in the house. There wasn't like people playing or jamming too much, but I know I've been told that I was banging on the pots and pans, you know, as soon as I could do that. Awesome. I was all attracted to music. Um, you know, with all the media at that time, it would have just been television primarily or records. So I can remember, you know, looking at the album cover for the Dave Brubeck Time Out album. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that was a big popular early 60s popular. And it was kind of a mainstream thing, but it had all those odd time songs, you know, Take Five and Blue Rondo a la Turk and just yeah. classics. Yeah. So that, along with, you know, discovering the Beatles, of course, and then um, the thing came. Okay. Um, just being aware of guitars and bands, you know, drums, guitar, and not knowing, oh, that's a bass. You know, one of the guys, the balls being a bass, but it's, you know, you're hearing the sounds. So just getting familiar with it. And the other sidebar to that was like the exposure to TV commercials. And ironically, I've, you know, ended up working in that industry quite a bit. Oh, yeah. I'll still, I'll still remember silly little jing from way back in the day, you know, the Kent cigarettes or something or certain melodies you go oh yeah i remember that and it's you know it still gets pops up again that's years funny later, so Kent yeah cigarettes man i haven't heard yeah. that i haven't well, I always, yeah <laughs> i, I always joke about that because if you listen to da 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 that's gun, gun smoke isn't it and if you're talking to a smoker uh that was is it right it's one of the uh, spielberg movies i forget oh uh, yeah it's raiders of the lost ark yeah Think. And then if you go to a smoker, it's a Kent, you know, and it was like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just so random, but that is you know, there's only 12 notes and I can get in trouble on sessions where, you know, original singer songwriters will write something and I'll hear it. And I, they sort of have a nickname. They'll go, Oh, you're the lick librarian. Cause I'll hear <laughs> something that's a similar sounding melody and go, doesn't that go with that song here? And they get all offended. So I have to really watch it. I have to be on good behavior to, Keep well, my that's mouth a, shut and play the drums, yeah. The fact that but, it's the same is mutually exclusive yeah. from that, you know. I mean, it, it is if it's it is what it is, man, you know. Yeah. Right. So anyways, it's a little bit of a sidebar here. You can probably edit this out if you want to. No, no, it's, it's all good, man. Yeah. It's part of the uh, yeah, just musical exposure, I think is where I'm coming from. Back to the family thing of the parents. You know, there was music around and, and it was so Supported at an early age it wasn't like oh we hate music i'm claiming so i think somehow it's you know in your soul kind of a thing or you just your dna i guess genetic thing where you're attracted to it and then yeah so they weren't professionals but you know they still love music and they're 
singing songs. My mom will always be, you know, singing something. So it's a f- source of happiness, I think, for a lot of people. Yeah. And is she still on the East Coast or is she out with ability you? to play it? Or... No, she, she's in SoCal here, just around the corner, a couple of miles from where we live here Great. in Newport Beach. So, yeah, they're still going strong. And my stepdad, too, he's sort of a musical guy. He likes to sing along, but he's, he's just he'd be doing chores in the yard and hear him singing silly songs, you know, just to him. Hey, that's like sort of buzzing. Hey, what's that? That sort of another sidebar is we got a song called Detour. And I've been playing that song live uh, with another artist, a new artist named Nick Marischal. He's a guitar player. And so that's a really fun band. We've been doing opening acts lots at the Canyon Clubs out here in SoCal. There's one in Agura, Santa Clarita, and uh, Pasadena. So we've opened for Ambrosia. Uh, we're doing one coming up for Little River Band. CTA, which is Danny Seraphine's version of the Chicago yep. band. And uh, uh, let's see, a couple other ones. Who am I missing? We opened for Albert Lee, who I played with. But anyways, that's wow. the song called Detour. We've been playing it, so it's kind of funny. It's like, wait, I know this song. My dad used to sing it when he was out in the yard, you know, doing some yard work. Detour, there's a muddy road ahead. Detour, you know, paid no mind to what it said. Should have read that <laughs> detour sign. It's some old, you know, classic. I forget who wrote it, but... We've been playing it live, anyways. That's funny, man. Yeah, was, you mentioned uh, all connect. You mentioned yeah. all those guys. I had Doug Jackson on here from Ambrosia, yeah. and I had um, oh yeah, yeah, Rich Herring sure. from 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 Little River Band on the show here a while ago too. Yeah, good guys, both yeah. of them. Oh really yeah, good guys. They're, yeah, and I got. Uh, wait a minute, is Bill Bill Champlin with CTA? Yes. Yeah, yes, I got Bill is. coming That's on like right. next week or something like that. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, wow, good, this is good timing, man. Good guy. Yeah, yeah. It's really <laughs> funny, man. Oh, yeah. No, he's great. Really good, yeah. So, so yeah. in college, you majored in business, yeah. which is un- very unusual for a musician, as you probably know. Yeah. Are, are you business-minded in general? Because, as you know, most musicians are not. Right. Good question, Craig. Um, first part of that is obviously the parents freaking out, like, wait a minute, you can't be a drummer, you can't be a musician, you better have something to fall back on. Okay. So, of course, I sort of took tape on that and struggled with, uh, you know, accounting classes and powered it out, but um, was able to get the two-year degree at the Orange Coast College and then transferred to Long Beach State, uh, where I met a lot of musicians I still work with to this day in the performance classes. So it was something, you know, just to be aware of it. Um, by no means am I, you know, wizard uh, stock investor, but it's just knowing how the, you know, the world works and being aware of things, economics, um, stuff like that. So I did, um, <laughs> the funny part, this is 1978. So it was my last semester of school, or later possibly, but I was able to meet Larry Carlton. And so he called me away to go on the road. So I decided my logic was school will always be there. But, you know, this is an opportunity. I've oh. got to go on the road with Larry. It was 23. It was Greg Matheson and Neil Steubenhaus and Larry doing a, you know, tour. We went to Japan, Mr. 335 Live in Japan album. Uh, we went all over kind of the East Coast, played at my father's place. Out in on Long Island. Island, yeah. In fact, it's, yeah, there's a bootleg of that floating around on the Internet somewhere. That's cool, And then, man. Um, was it the bottom bottom line? In yeah, Manhattan, down in the know, city. So we did the circuit. Certain- yeah, and you know because of Larry's presence uh, with all his body of work, and also the Steely Dan thing was super popular at that time. Sure. So we would do you know instrumental tunes, and he had just released one of his earlier solo albums, and it had uh, Jeff Porcaro on it, who's one of my all-time favorites, sure. and Abe Laboreal. But those guys couldn't go on the road, so he you know got the new young guys that came to town. So that right. was a fun really great learning experience and, you know, was in there with the big time guys and that kind of validated my career at that point to say, Oh, okay, you're in with this crowd. So, you know, Larry opened a lot of doors for me. And so that whole guitar connection, it was almost like the seed for me, but I had played with guys prior to that, you know, obviously the guitar thing is a very large part of it. I always joke that I'm the <laughs> ballet drummer to the superstar guitar players. Hey, great <laughs> title to have, <laughs> man. Yeah. you know, yeah, just for fun, you know, people are always like surprised, you know, to have anything, like you said, George Benson to, uh, you know, Eddie Van Halen. We just did a couple of live shows, and this was back in the NAM show and things like that out here in the West Coast. That's great, man. But, you know, just rare opportunities to play with legendary guests. Yeah. So you anyway, never. Back uh, to your questions. So the business thing, yeah. You, you never regretted. The thing was an area that. 
yeah sorry yeah, dropping we, out yeah yeah you never you never yeah, said oh man i that was a bad decision <laughs> yeah good for you man no the only thing i still you know in the back of my mind i mean now it's something where i could just you know pretty much do it online and get a yeah. bachelor degree just to kind of spin off on it but you know one one semester away from it so but it was just a, a direction thing that was a passion pursuit. And I said, you know, this feels right. I'm going to go for it. So <laughs> Good for you, man. Uh, yeah. Congratulations. That was a good decision. Yeah. So the, Co- kind of courageous you. decision, yeah. too, at that age, I think. You know, so I give you credit. Yeah. I mean, it was sort of what I was leaning towards and so knowing that, okay, this is what I do best. The, the business thing is always been a struggle or, you know, it, wasn't, it just required work and effort. And at the time I was playing five nights a week and then, the school I was living still at home, this would have been like, uh, yeah, the early mid seventies. And so I was commuting to Long Beach to Newport's about 40 minutes, 30 minutes, depending on traffic and then playing till 2 AM every night. So health wise, I was starting to feel the toll. I was like really skinny and just had low energy level and, you know, needed to kind of like make a decision. What am I trying to do here? I can't play in a club band and then go try to be doing physics class at 8 AM sure. <laughs> on campus after oh five hours of sleep yeah that's good for you though man yeah, so, I'm, I'm glad you thought that through yeah um I, a little bit yeah no <laughs> it's a good decision man let's talk <laughs> about you've, you've worked with so many people i can ask you 40 questions but i'm going to go through some of the artists you've worked with if you could yeah. talk about how you got the gig and a cool or interesting story yeah. about working with them. you let's start with larry you already talked about how you got the gig um yeah. he came to how did how, wait yeah. minute, how did he find you how did how did he know you yeah yeah I'll make, try to make this as brief as possible. Another friend named Carlos Rios, who's a great guitarist uh, from the South Bay here in California, like Torrance area. Carlos went to school with Larry's cousin, Steve Carlton, who's also a studio engineer. And so we had played together with an artist, might not be on the resume, I think it is Cindy Greco. She's the girl that sang the theme song from the Laverne and Shirley show. Oh, yeah. We're going to make it. Yeah. Give us any a chance. We'll make it. So... You know, we were recruited because we were young guys to go play for her band on the road. So this is where it gets a little tricky. So I'm still at Long Beach State, and we're driving up on a bus, like on a Thursday or Friday, to, uh, near Berkeley, California, for this big jazz festival, college jazz festival. So we're on the bus, and we're having fun, partying. Get up there, we play the festival, and then Sunday, it's time to drive home. I'm going, man, I don't feel like sitting on that bus for eight hours. So me and maybe somebody else are looking to flights out of Oakland airport to go back to Orange County. So sure enough, get up, make a 7 a.m. flight or whatever it was, 8 a.m., get home, just exhausted because we've been up, you know, playing music and hanging, listening to a bunch of other great musicians. Sidebar story, just uh, the guy, Gordon Goodwin, I know that name's come up because Andrew Sinewick played in his band, the guitarist. And yep. so this was before Andrew was around, but uh, the Cal our arrival but you know they're all professional comrades now at this point we, we all play together but that was like the top rivalry between cal state long beach cal state northridge anyway okay. so i decided to fly home get home i'm exhausted I'm, oh man i'm gonna go to bed i'm just gonna lay down this is before cell phones phone rings it's carlos rios hey john what are you doing <clears throat> we're this job today this afternoon a jam from four to eight up in the south bay i think it was like down at the beach redondo it's like oh okay cool i'll come up so I go drive up there, and it's uh, Rich, Richard Elliott, who's a saxophonist. He's a smooth jazz guy. And a couple other cats in the band. And then in through the door walks Larry Carlton. I'm like, I didn't know that. But then they say, hey, Larry's here. I'm like, Larry, you're kidding. I've been listening to his music with, uh, you know, Steely Dan stuff, uh, obviously the Crusaders. Um, and the other band was Tom Scott, LA Express. Mm. So anyways, long story, even longer, we gig ends and he goes hey you guys want to come up to my house and jam I'm like are you kidding of course um, so carlton so, says that to you guys so he must you must have yeah. had a great yeah. vibe well he was there just and i didn't know at the time he was looking for a drummer so they'd already auditioned a bunch of guys and i was completely clueless so i went all the way up to hollywood with carlos and the bass player and we jammed till about midnight or something and i was just on cloud nine I was like yeah. this is unbelievable this is after getting up at you know 6 a.m to catch this flight <laughs> <laughs> so like the, the, the dream day yeah. so anyways do that and then he gets my number and he calls me back twice to, to go play with his guys which is Abe Laboriel one time and the next time was Pops Robert Pops Popwell who recently passed away too a great bass player and Greg Matheson so the, all those guys gave me the thumbs up so that kind of opened the door for that experience like I said the time frame this is like 1978 so 
that was my big launch, you know, but that it's a story that's kind of, I always tell it in many ways. So that's what a great story. That Larry. Yeah. What, <laughs> uh, pretty wacky, but you, no, but it's the serendipity mm-hmm. of all these stories that I hear is just amazing. Like you couldn't make these mm-hmm. things up, you know how it, and it's always like, right, that's true. this yeah. guy knew this guy and on a whim, it's yeah. always like on a whim. Hey, what are you right. doing today? Yeah. It, you know, it's almost, yeah, it is. Yeah, and it's the, really cool. Yeah. Well, if I had chosen to take that bus ride, I would have missed that chance. Yeah. So that was one of those things. I would have been stuck on the bus with no cell phone to know, oh, yeah, I'm going to go to this gig. So, you know, I sort of instinctively or somebody was, you know, yeah, yeah. in control. So he's like, oh, you better get home because there's a chance you're going to go do this gig. And mm-hmm. boom, there you go. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, and what is the chance? Is that, but yeah. Yeah. Ne- yeah. No, it's very, it's very much. Good, something's yeah. in control that's a greater. Yeah that's makes some yeah. of these things happen. Like, you know, you've probably never flown back yeah. to a gig ever. And all of a sudden, you know, no, no, it would have, <clears throat> that was on my own dime too. Cause it's like, well, I'm going to spend the money rather than, you know, most musicians, it's hard for you to open your wallet on occasion. Cause yeah. we're all freelance or most of us, you know, it's like, wait, but other times it's like, no, I got to get out of here. So I'm you know, going to bolt home. So wow. that was a good choice. <laughs> yeah, man. Great choice. So. Talk about a, an interesting story yeah. or a funny story about your uh, tenure with Larry. Yeah. Um, gosh, there was a lot of fun moments with him. I'm trying to think of anything wacky or funny that happened. Um, I think one of the first gigs we went and did a sound check was Middlebury College in Vermont. Mm-hmm. Which, um, and so you know we had a we we're in the concert hall, so we did the sound check, and then they said, okay, let's go get dinner. And Larry was famous for having this the, the volume pedal kind of swell. He did it on So Far Away. There's, a I think, the Crusaders version. And it's kind of one of his signature sounds. It kind of sounds like a cat. That's, you know, kind of the volume pedal, show bud. So that mm-hmm. was the thing that I think the pedal steel players used. So he had the show bud with him on the road. It's 335 and the, what do you call it, the Mesa Boogie, the 777. Those are the settings. So mm-hmm. <laughs> he always had it lined up. <laughs> And that thing sat right in front of my bass drum and opened that cabinet, man. It was loud. I got so it. anyways, we come back from sound check, and guess what? The, the show bud volume pedal has been left the stage. So he was furious. He's like, what? Somebody ripped off his show bud, you know, just unplugged it and took it. So they were scrambling to find something, you know, just so he could do the show. And he was really upset about that. But somehow we got through the show. I don't know if they found one on campus or what would have been the other choice of Dunlop or, you know, I think Ernie Ball has since come out with volume pedals. So that was, <laughs> we were all kind of freaked out, like, oh, crap, you know, they stole his stuff. So uh, that's, you know, one funny thing. I'm just trying to think of anything else that was funny. Uh, I told this other story where we were in a show at, um, up in Denver. What's the name? Uh, the, it's a summer jazz festival, and we kind of got scolded with the band. I'll keep the names anonymous. But we played, and the guys that came on after us, fairly well-known mainstream jazz artists, and they were sort of making fun of us, like, but you just heard wasn't jazz. Oh and my god! The crowd went nuts. Uh, so yeah, I'll just keep the names anonymous. But it's a fairly well-known jazz trumpet player. So <laughs> wow, <laughs> and his band. But uh, wow. it was just kind of you know. And at the time, Alex Acuna was a great percussionist. Was on tour with us. It was Greg Matheson, Alex, and John Pena on bass. Mm-hmm. Um, Winter Park Jazz Festival. There you go. That's the name of the event, the Winter Park. And it's a really fun festival, middle of the summer. You're way up 10,000 feet in the mountain. So basically, the guy who told it half the crowd, they got up and left his show. It wasn't the right thing to do that. So that was a, uh, you know, <laughs> that's an hilarious gig. But everything else, I mean, it's always really high caliber playing for sure. Oh my God, and yeah. uh, he loved. The idea of it being kind of fresh and different, you know, you'd honor the song with the melodies and play, you know, a set list. But um, he wanted it to be very free for me, kind of a, you know, not free form jazz, but it would just be, you know, play something different. So he'd get inspired. You know, he always encouraged that kind of approach. And that's what makes him so special. that He still does that to this day. You know, you're going to hear an amazing performance and it's just for that night. You know, then the next night he's challenging himself to do something even better. So that's, a, that's great. <laughs> yeah. He's remarkable. Yeah. Ron Wood. Ron Wood. Ronnie Wood. Yeah. That was kind of through some friends who are techs that work for the stones and they still do. In fact, I was just this morning reconfirming my 
tickets for the August 26th performance in Arizona with the Stones. I'm going to go fly there to see him rather than L.A. I've seen him a bunch of times, but our dear friend Pierre de Beauport, who's Ron, uh, Keith Richards' tech, and another friend that used to work for them is named Rouse, R-O-U-Z-E. Dave now is a tech for Brad Paisley, so Dave moved to Nashville. Dave was Larry Carlton's sort of right-hand man and had the studio and ran a studio for Larry and, and uh, really dear friends. So we had like a little side project band that we just jam around with. Dave played bass, Pierre played guitar, and myself on drums, just, you know, writing songs, original. So through that connection, Ronnie had one more track to do for an album, and we did it in Hollywood. Wow. Um, it's a studio that's right across from East West, and I'm trying to think of what the actual name of the studio is on Gordon Street, I'd have to remember. But just went there to do this one tune, and he wasn't even there, unfortunately. But uh, it was, uh, still, we did the track. It ended up on the album, and so that was fun. He was great. super cool. And then <clears throat> Dave Rouse had a demo session for one of Ronnie's, I don't know if he has more than his children, but this, it was his daughter. They were going to do a track for an album for her. So brought the drums over to the studio, played on it, and then Charlie Watts showed up. So I had to, I have a duplicate kit like his, so he was really cool. Oh, so he wow. played, and then I played... That was a really fun. I had never heard that track, actually, or, you know, where it ended up. But that was something that Ronnie was kind of involved in. So I think he'd heard me play it, and then Charlie wasn't available to come work on the album at that time. So I That's really cool. I that. was able to rub shoulders with the big boys. But, yeah. Well, I mean, just fun. kudos to so, you for your, um, obviously, yeah. not just your skill level, but your ability to work well with people because these are heavy guys. All these people that Ooh. I've talked about in a yeah. minute could have yeah. anybody, you know, and they picked a guy like yeah. you because you're a top guy like uh, everybody else. I mean, it's really uh, a great accomplishment. You. Yeah, <laughs> man. It's, no, I mean, you know what it's like. You get you, It's the best yeah. athlete available, yeah. and you're the best athlete. So, I mean, that's yeah. really nice. Uh, thank you. I never uh, thought of it in those terms, but that's a nice compliment. Thank well, you. it's thank true, you. man. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, you know, Larry yeah. Carlton, yeah. Ron Wood, Rod Stewart, George Benson, there's no, like, shortage of – you know, it's like Down the Yankees, there, man. Yeah. Who wants to, everybody wants to play for him, right? <laughs> yeah, sure, that's right. Yeah. Rod, talk about Rod now. Yeah, okay. Rod is a fun story. Uh, other friend I mentioned earlier, Jim Cox, who's mm. a keyboard player, and he was on that trip to Berkeley. Met him at Long Beach State, and he's one of my favorite players on the planet. Incredible mind. He has an album collection of well over ten thousand albums that he oh. can pretty much tell you anything about. That. He's like, you know, oh, yeah, that was produced by so-and-so, and they recorded it there, and these guys, it's like, wow, Jim, how do you know it? So <laughs> Steve Morris gave him the nickname Mr. Music Business, <laughs> just because he was so blown away at Jim's knowledge about just about any style of, you know, contemporary music. So Jim was working on these Rod Stewart standard albums. I think it's uh, Clive Davis was the executive producer, and they had just started recording these tracks, so it's the American Songbook, and they're wrapping up the project. So I get a call from Richard Perry, who's the producer. It's like, hey, Jim Cox said I should call you to come play on this track. We've already recorded it, but I want to, the drums aren't quite right. And I won't mention who the player was, who's a legendary guy. And once I heard the track, it was just a different approach. It was something where the guy was playing Blastics. And this is a standard. I think it was, they can't take that away from me, yeah, which I've played a thousand times. At okay. My, yeah. Uh, the way you wear your hat, you know, da, 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 da. oh, no, they can't take that away from me. You know, so it's real classic standard tune. And um, that's what the whole album was about. So I come in to underdub drums. You know, they already have a track in place with all the parts. It's like, all right, well, let me, I'm going to play brushes because that's normally what I play. I call it the tuxedo two beat. Yeah. It's just, you know, and uh, came in and they heard it. And, yeah, that's what we want you know so they weren't able to explain it so one of the interesting things about that album as they got it going is that uh, Richard was hiring all the top jazz players in town who are incredible and you would know a lot of the names Peter Erskine all these great players and so they'd come in and do a jazz performance which is interacting with the music and playing what the way you're supposed to Richard had a, a style of producing which was a little bit more hands-on management so you know, he wanted to know exactly what's your bass drum pattern. You know, he's like oh, wow. pop albums. So we would spend quite a bit of time dissecting what's the formula. So once we found the formula, we did five of these albums. We were the West Coast team. And then the uh, producer, the, Phil Ramone, was the, the East Coast team. 
he passed away, but um, we did <clears throat> so many of those tracks, and then there was we came up with like a, a process for it, meaning that we would do, I think, uh, how many takes on the same song? These are three minute songs, so you do it at one, two or three different tempos, like within a couple of clicks of each yeah. other, and then two, two or three different keys because they wanted to make sure that Rod could sing it. And so Rod, we met him a few times. He would come to the studio, but they also had a stunt guy that was <laughs> could sing the scratch track just so we could, you know, get the guide. And it was very kind of organic process in a way. We knew what the assignment was with the material, but then the way we would formulate the track. So that first album was the first chance to get in on the project. And my mantra for that is I went in and it was pretty weird and wacky. And I go, okay, I'm just going to try to make this guy happy. So we were there for six or seven hours to play a three minute song and would try it again. And then, like I said, this idea of uh, what's the bass drum pattern, what fill are you going to play going into the bridge? And, you know, let me hear this, let me hear that. I remember one point we actually recorded one hand at a time because he wanted to sort of have control and that just didn't work. Wow. You must be on, super like, with, patient. Uh, it was an incredible test of patience, but that was my, like I said, the mantra was like, I'm just going to try to make this guy happy. A lot of guys would just throw the sticks down and say, get the heck out of here. You know, I'm not putting up with this. I'm a great jazz player. So I said, well, no, I'm going to separate my ego yeah. from my attitude. That's a whole other story that I had to learn, <clears throat> excuse me, on, on, on the Barry Manilow gig. That was a whole other episode. But anyways, I'll wrap this up. So the Rod thing was great. He came to the studio several times, would hang out with us, really witty, fun, you know, sharp guy, and he would sing the tracks and have a lot of fun. So this, like I said, it ended up being material and then we were at <clears throat> several different studios in LA Conway was one of them <clears throat> I don't know if we were at Capital with that project um that was there yesterday on a different thing but um yeah it was really fun and those songs are classics and I was pretty familiar with the material after having done what we call out here the casual rule I'm going to take a drink yeah go ahead Bye. was Jim Cregan his guitar player <clears throat> then so <clears throat> I don't actually know who it was it was um we had a couple of different guys. Larry Koontz played on some of the stuff. And I forget, there was another younger guitar player that I don't remember, but basically they, their job was to play Freddie Green. Chung, 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 chung. So wow. it was like very steady for every yeah. quarter note pulse in the right note duration, which is important. If it's too chink, 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 it sounds too aggressive. It's got to be a full value quarter note. So bum, 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 rather than bum, bum. But, sure. but then it sounds too staccato. So they'd spend time on that and getting the right sound. Michael Thompson was the pianist, and he plays for the Eagles. There's Michael Thompson, the guitarist that we all know. Yeah, right. But he, uh, Michael Thompson, from San Diego, and really talented. His brothers are musicians, I think. So he was on piano, and he did a great job. He understood how to do the arrangements and the little hooks and in between the vocals. And different bass players. They had Reggie McBride on some of it, Trey Henry, who's a fabulous you know, bass player. L.A. main staple in the session scene. Uh, Chris Golden was the other bass player that played a lot, and he was working for uh, Engelbert Humperdinck. So, you oh, know, all these guys yeah, yeah. get called in, and just it was a fun little team. And like I said, we did ton of tracks. I don't know how many total, but some of them made it to the final. Some of them didn't because we were sort of not competing, but they had the East Coast team doing stuff too. Right. And Rob was very cool with all of us. You know, I don't think he would know me on first name basis if I saw him on the street. But, you know, we had fun at the sessions, and it was a great experience to get right. to play those songs and reintroduce another generation to it, too. I mean, it's critically, uh, you know, panned sometimes people, the jazz players, all that stuff sounds like elevator music or whatever. And I understand because it's not super adventurous, but it's introducing some great catalog of music to people. And, you know, a lot of times you'll go to a wedding now and you'll hear the Rod Stewart's track the, the bride and groom on a dance to one of the songs and they go, oh yeah i think i played on that track that's pretty funny you know? that's cool so it's you know their time with serial lives on and it's a new treatment with a new voice that everyone's familiar with as soon as you hear it you go oh that's rod stewart and rod's big influence i think was billy holiday he'd always be talking about i wanted to sound kind of like really cool billy holiday i didn't realize so that, that was sort of the inspiration i think for him yeah that's what he would talk about or that was the instruction too from richard and richard was great as a producer i mean he's really fun and he likes to, you know, make it an event. So it was uh, some things that other producers would be mindful of as far as like, okay, guys, come on, we got to get going here. Let's, you know, knock this right out. He would enjoy the experience and maybe take a little bit more time with it. But it was, you know, like I said, if you're patient, then you could hang with it. 
a lot of the other guys on that first album were getting chopped off of it because of the the unwillingness to like you know work you know, under those conditions. But once they found the formula, it worked. And you know, several albums later, <laughs> hey, well, you got five albums of gigs out of this, man. Yeah, that's right. That's and, exactly right. And I'm that's sure yeah. the guy hired you for other stuff yeah. later on in your career. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, in fact, we did, uh, Engelbert Humperdinck. We did uh, two albums with him did a country album, which was kind of interesting, and then another album, which was all songs by British composers. And that was really challenging because it was everything from Sting to some of the older, uh, you know, wider shade of pale. It was like a really sure. wide scope of music, which I enjoyed the challenge to be able to play all those styles. So, it's, yeah, that's, I forgot about that, but you're right. Yeah, it does at least other things. Yeah. So let me ask you this. You mentioned that you said you learned the lesson of the of being of separating your ego yeah. from your attitude on Barry Manilow's gig. Talk about yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. So just to tie it in what we were just talking about with Rod thing, you know, the idea, <clears throat> if you have this attachment to what you're doing, like I'm the best of this or whatever. And I think that was the case with some of the other musicians uh, that were getting called to play in those sessions for Rod that, you know, then the workability thing, you might not be flexible enough to handle it and say, okay, I'm going to, set my ego aside and then be able to do the gig. So the Barry thing, this was 80, 82, 80 through 82. And then I'd you know, been playing two years with Larry Carlton. It was like, wow, we're rock gods. We're going to Japan. We're playing, you know, these big concerts. You know, I can't do anything. And, you know, with Barry, it was a learning curve of like, oh, wow, this is a whole other approach to playing music. His thing that I learned, which I also applied many years later with the Promise Keepers, is how to play ballads, how to play a metronome marking of like 64, which is fairly slow. Yeah. You've got one, two, three. He doesn't want to hear eighth notes, which is usually ch ta 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 And the reason being is because he's playing a piano part that's going to go ding, 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 ding. So that's quarter note pulse. So all he wants to hear is like boom, chick, boom, chick, boom, boom, or maybe chick, and that's you like feel like you got handcuffs on so it was a i had to swallow the ego pill to say look all right i'll do that but man I, i've got to play some more stuff let's keep the drummer i gotta but once you found out how it worked in the context of a show it was really cool and you hear the way the track can build and it was just a different style that i sort of had to learn and i was thinking that the guy the band leader was thinking i was getting frustrated and he goes look man you know don't blow this because you know it's a great gig and just so it was learning, and he even said, you know, just separate your ego from gratitude, you know. So you come in and go, yeah, I'm going to make you happy. You know, what do you want me to play? And that approach has been golden for me going forward, you know, in situations. And I think young musicians or any musician really, you know, is uh, needs to keep that in mind from time to time. You're still going <laughs> to sound great, and, but you're serving the music first and then not being such a self-centered kind of approach to where, wait, I'm not getting a chance to do my thing. <laughs> well, well, the other reality comes up in different. Yeah. Sorry, well, so the other reality of it is you're in the service business. You're getting paid to, you know, and it sounds like you just had a good awareness that I'm mm -hmm. in the service business here. You know, if the guy, if I'm cutting lawns or if yeah. I'm doing whatever, I got to do what you know the person paying me wants. And yeah. this is, you know, I'm, I'm making right. music for them, so I have to do it. That's good. That's right. that's a very good way to think of it too. Cause and that thought had not necessarily crossed my mind. I think I was, you know, on this upswing of like, wow, I'm playing with, you know, Larry Carlton. Sure. And all my guitar buddies were freaking out like, oh, my God. <laughs> and so you think it's easy to get into the mindset like, you know, oh, I can do nothing wrong and everything I do is going to be great. Well, you know, you have to make adjustments. Like you said, it is a service business and being humble enough to say, all right, let's <laughs> not try to you know, derail this situation and, you know, make the right choices. Yeah. So that's good. I like that. that that's know, pretty cons oriented. Uh, yeah. Well, all, every single ses top session <laughs> person that I've interviewed, you know, it's probably yeah. over a hundred at this point have, has that mindset. Yeah, They're can. aware of, I'm not here to, yeah. I'm here to f yeah. serve the Show song off. and their, their version of what serving the song is. And even if it, I find yeah. it repulsive, it doesn't matter. It's not my song. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Right. Very good. Yeah. I like it. Great. Yeah. Talk about, uh, so many guys, uh, Ben, George Benson, man. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was a fun gig. Another connection through Long Beach State, great pianist named David Witham. David also did a lot of the shows at Pantages Theater. We mentioned that earlier yeah. about The Lion King. Mm -hmm. So David's great jazz player, great musician. He can play classical. I think he studied on the East Coast. I forget which, uh, you know, Eastman or one of the big music schools. And he lives in Long Beach. Um, so there was a, he had taken over the chair for Dave Garfield was busy doing something else. So he stepped in. This would have been around um, what's the era of um, 90s. I want to say 94. I'm terrible with chronology. I should be much a timekeeper, and I don't know what things happen. Oh, man, you've it's it's all, you got so much stuff going on, too, yeah. man. It's like, you yeah. Know, it's it's hard to keep track right. of all that stuff, man. I think yeah. So it would have been like early '90s and stuff. So they needed a drummer. I forget what happened with the other guy that was there. And so I just did a brief stint, about six months. The first gig, it was funny. They called me and go, "Okay, George needs a drummer. So come to Houston and you'll do the show." I'm like, "Okay, what about rehearsal? No, just come to. <laughs> well, you're gonna do the show." I'm like, "Okay." And luckily, I've always been a fan of his, so I knew a lot of the songs that were on the radio. <sighs> You know, I mean, Masquerade and <clears throat> Give Me the Night and all these great tunes. Yeah. So I was somewhat familiar. So I get there, note, and there's basically just a sound check to kind of just check stuff. And I go, do well, you guys have a set list or any charts? No, there's no set list. There's no charts. I'm like, oh, okay, well. So, it was, and then George just starts playing and everyone just jumps in. So luckily, you know, they didn't throw me any curveballs and I was able to hang and, you know, lay down the groove and then. Like, okay, great, you're hired. So the next gig, this was October, and then the next gig was a three-week tour wow. in Australia in December. It's their Christmas season, but it's also like summertime. In Australia, so yeah. Three, yeah, three weeks. Uh, I think it was um, was Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane, all at the Hilton Hotel. So you're in the same venue for like four or five nights in a row. It was really fun. It was great. Came home from that. And then the next several months, we went overseas. We went to... Um, I don't think we went to Japan, but it was like Singapore, Philippines, and Malaysia. And by the time the last stop was the Philippines, and somewhere along the way, I'd gotten really bad stomach flu or something with the food. So I was in pretty bad shape and uh, was starting to tank, you know, for me. Sure. I was like, couldn't leave the hotel in a day and just was trying to stay hydrated. So that was fun. And then Larry called again, and I had to sort of make a choice like, well, what am I going to do? You know, I'd been with Larry before that. And so, I had to call Dave and say, man, I'm sorry, but, you know, Larry needs me to go do this. And they had some more work coming up. So I sort of walked away from the George gig and it was like, oh, man. And it was fun. It was a whole different style and approach. But, man, what an incredible player. The sound checks, I'm sorry that they don't record those. It's like he'll just play some stuff. It's so amazing. And then George is super consistent with the show. And he's, you know, plays amazingly. But, I mean, some of the stuff he would play at soundcheck, guitar-wise, you guys would go nuts hearing what he would be doing. <clears throat> it was almost like a <clears throat> test flight around the uh, the field, you know, and he would just go for stuff that you wouldn't normally hear maybe so during cool. the show. And, you know, the show, it wasn't like he was going to tone it down for the show, but there were certain things he would play because they're part of the songs when he's singing along with those melodies, you know, that he would have to do it. But when he's just jamming on it at soundcheck, it's like, wow, you know, his mind is amazing. He can come up with these lines. He's so fluid, too. That's just really natural and you know, he's tapping his foot and he's just having a, you know, it's like a soaring bird or eagle. It's pretty amazing. You know, iconic and guy, I guess singer and player. Yeah. Carlton's gig afforded you more flexibility to step yeah. outside the box, I would imagine. That too. And just also from an allegiance standpoint, it's like, well, wait, you know, Larry kind of got me started. So, yeah. you know, who gets first dibs? I mean, that's always a, a tough choice to say. Very much. And I was just looking at, the fit and what was ahead and so i thought well you know if he i'm gonna go do this because it was uh you know a history there and i knew already meshed into the sound i'd already recorded with larry and stuff and so that factored into it a little bit you know to say look you know <laughs> hey i hired you to play on my record i need you to come play with me no and George, not that he hadn't but it was uh and ironically i did actually do a session for george through uh we mentioned the name um Michael Cimbello earlier, yeah. Maniac, you know, he's a songwriter. Yep. And so there was a, there's an album that's never come out that's in the can, and it has some great players on it. And we recorded that at Ocean Wave. And so I was playing with Michael Cimbello, and he pulled me in on the gig. And I think it was Freddie Washington on bass, Michael on guitar, and uh, 
Um, what's his name? The keyboard player that plays with everybody. Oh, growing up playing Greg filling game. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And so this was some, um, yeah, amazing player. And this was something that was being produced by the trombonist from the crusaders. And I got to think of Wayne Henderson, I think my, my brain. No, <laughs> this is really man, you, you've anyway, got, so you've literally mentioned about actually, 50 names in, in 25 minutes so far. So yeah. you're, you're excused, man. There's no way I'm like sitting here a bewildered how your call recall is, is so sharp. So you're doing great. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> um, but anyways, I'll wrap this up. So yeah, that was, I think it's in the can as they say, I don't think they ever released that album. And so George was there, and he was going along with the process. I could tell he was not not apprehensive, but it was almost like, okay, well, I'll play these songs, and there were different people had written the songs. So that was really fun. It was neat to get the chance to record. And then I don't even think he knew that I was the same drummer that he'd hired to go play these live dates with no, you know, you're later on. Because, you know, they're not thinking that way. Yeah. It wasn't like, hey, man, good to see you again. He wouldn't have put those two elements together because it was a whole different context. And I just kind of kept it there. I didn't even, I don't think wow. I ever mentioned it to him to say, hey, remember we did this thing? Because you don't know in their mind, was that a bad experience? Oh. So I don't want to trigger something. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. You're that guy that's on that. Right. Okay. You know, so I don't know what the response might be. <laughs> yeah, so, but, yeah. I can understand I'm here today that. And we're going to have fun. You're digging what's happening. Yeah. I could totally <laughs> but, uh, understand maybe that. Maybe that's not a good memory for him. Yeah, and it's reason, probably it not it, but I, yeah, I yeah. could understand yeah. that. Yeah, I so, could understand that. You, you want well, to err on the side yeah. of being conservative, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. There you go. Good point. Yeah, yeah Greg. I know. <laughs> hey, uh, yeah. talk about Steve Morse. You know, I interviewed Steve. It's one of the most popular yeah. interviews I did. He's such a... Um, oh, yeah. Just a Incredible. gentle... Yeah. I mean, besides being a monster musician, he's such a gentle, yeah. kind guy. And he's, he's so... Yeah. Um, gold i mean you know he don't stop whatever he's he's just work 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 yeah. um yeah and we when we talked about all that but he's just such a kind person what would what, you do with steve mm -hmm. yeah yeah steve we met through again the ernie ball connection with sterling sure ball we had this band called fifth base all stars which is sort of the, the core band for this mutual admiration society project and so we were going to um at the time we would be doing trade shows in japan or in england in Germany. And so Sterling would package it like it was, it was always going to be Albert Lee because he was kind of the point man and the late great Sherwood Ball, who was a singer songwriter. That was Sterling's oldest brother, who was an amazing talent. He was on all the Toyota commercials that you would hear. And also, but in addition, Oster, he's on several projects with him and Airplay, I think is the name of that band. Okay. So there's some really cool live footage of them playing in Japan and stuff. Um, so, uh, I think either Steve had just signed up with Ernie Ball with the guitar, Music Man guitars. Sure. So, you know, him and Sterling had a relationship. It's like, hey, we're going to have Steve Morris is going to come play. Oh, okay, cool. Holy shit, this guy's amazing. You know, Dixie Dregs and oh. pretty incredible. And he's a super... And what I love him is his playing. Like, uh, and he's a pilot, too. So maybe this ties in. He got his commercial uh, airline pilot, as you probably know. But it's almost like it's the preparation for all those steps as a takeoff. And when you hear him play a solo, I remember he had these little amps and like three or four of the volume pedals back to this show bud or whatever, the Ernie Ball pedals. Mm -hmm. And it was almost like a guy going through truck gears where the sound just kept getting bigger and bigger. And the way he would shape his sound was just mesmerizing for me. I would be sitting there listening while I'm playing. I'm going, oh, my God, this sounds like an album. And the Sonics... He would play a and then step on the pedal and it would go woo like a big, you know, moment of reverb, then suck it right out by stepping off of it. I'm like, this is amazing how he would add layers to the sound. Yeah. Um, contrast to a guy like Albert Lee, who's got his sound and he's going to play and it's just burning and he's so fluid, you know, the, and it's so consistent. Yeah. And so and Steve's amazing, but I mean, just the creativity to use his technique along with some of the sonic qualities was very impressive and it's still to this day i'm always amazed and he's a lot of fun he's a guy that's just constantly practicing and i think he's had some arm issues yes, or, you know like hand, hand issues. his hand his wrist yeah so and then he would get so upset you know he'd be like we'd be in the lobby and you know japan waiting to land. if somebody was one or two minutes late he would really get upset because like hey i'm here and those guys aren't here let's go come on we gotta go you know and it's just a professional courtesy you don't want to yeah. just blow off okay guys meeting at 11 
and especially in a country there, 11 means that's 11. Let's go because you're catching a bullet train or something. Uh, but uh, uh, Steve would always be practicing to keep his chops up. And then Albert would just have the guitar on his back, wouldn't even pull it out. And it's like, okay, let's go play. <laughs> just right like that. So just a different. Uh, yeah, Steve is super yeah. intense. Yes, I mean, that's right. I don't mean yeah. like intense as a as a uh, yeah. in, in, his work ethic is intense. Yeah. As a person, he's actually quite the opposite. Oh. He's very late laid back you know he's like a surfer guy he's so yeah. gentle um but he's yeah. very intense with his work ethic and, he, and he's so polite yeah. and i couldn't yes. believe yes. this um <laughs> yeah. i yes. was supposed he to is. interview yeah. him like no I, he's one of my favorites just a class I, I think i was supposed to interview him like one o'clock or something like that and mm -hmm. what happened he was going to be in mexico they were playing with deep purple yeah deep and purple. something happened where they had to cancel the rest of the tour so mm -hmm. he was flying this wasn't all of a sudden he's flying all night to get back home mm -hmm. right and he texts me or he calls me say hey listen my they lost my guitar so i'm oh at the gosh. airport i'm running behind i said look <laughs> man let's move this yeah. let's make this another yeah. week you know you i don't yeah. expect yeah. you to relax you know get some sleep yeah. I, I don't want you to like fly all Tell night yourself. and then like hang out with me i mean this is like yes. now we're not curing cancer here man you know you can yeah. do this next week or next month you know if it's he, and uh he comes on this show i think we did it one at three o'clock you know what he does the first thing he goes i just want to apologize to you for being late i'm like yeah. oh my god you, like you don't owe me an apology man i'm like so grateful that you're here but that's the way he is he's just a very genuine you know rock solid yeah. you know he, he's the kind of guy he says yes you don't need a contract that is yes right you know yes that kind of guy uh another quick point on steve and then we'll move on but he was super uh supportive of the effort that we were doing with this mutual admiration thing because sterling and him are very close friends Good. so we do a track and this is basically a chance for sterling to play guitar sterling's always been on the bass okay so he would he would, you know, we'd record something and then he'd send it to Steve and goes, hey, Steve, what do you think? And Steve was always so positive with Sterling and us to say, no, man, you should try to do this. And obviously Steve's on the album. Um, I think he does the in crowd or something. And he just plays an incredible. Oh, the, what, yeah. um, <laughs> P.S. Yeah. song. Yeah. Uh, with the, I can't uh, have the brain for it. Ramsey no, Lewis. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, he he was like a sounding board, too, for Sonics. He helped us get connected with another gentleman named Bill Evans, who Steve had worked with as an engineer to do some sonic shaping and stuff like that. Very I don't know cool. what the right term is for that, but, you know, behind the scenes. Like I said, Steve's a real cheerleader and just supportive guy, you know, of what we're doing. And, uh, yeah, he's a remarkable world talent guitarist <laughs> extraordinaire. Yeah, yeah great guy. I was, yeah. I was really yeah. happy to chat with him. Um yeah. What'd you do with Eddie? You mentioned it was a couple of, it wasn't a lot, but you said you did a couple of things with Eddie Van Halen. Yeah. 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 That was, um, another really cool, uh, chance thing again through Sterling. Um, at the time, uh, they had had, uh, they were working on a guitar model. I think it was, um, uh, for music man. Hmm. And so Eddie came, I think this was 92. I want to say the NAM show. We did a really big performance at one of the hotels there in Anaheim. And then prior to that, we had done another gig. There was a place called the Trancus Beach House, which is out near uh, Malibu. So here again, it was kind of the Biff Babies All-Stars Band. And I think it was, I don't know that Steve Morris would have been on that one. It was Albert Lee and Sherwood and Jim Cox and Sterling's on bass. And then I'm trying to think, maybe Steve was on it, but maybe not. And so Lukather was just coming into the scene to play with us, but... He hadn't been on stage with us yet. So Eddie is there as the featured guest. And so he didn't know a lot of the songs. And then he was even sort of going, man, I don't know this stuff. All the scales, my stuff doesn't work on top of what you're playing. <laughs> and a lot of the material, that Biff Babies All-Stars is kind of major scale. And Eddie's thing is maybe more pentatonic minor or whatever. You know, you guys would know the scales better than I do. But still, it was amazing to hear Eddie's playing and I remember this at the sound check. His tech was up there getting his rig all set up. And the tech picks up the guitar and goes, rah, 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 rah. I'm like, wow, that's pretty loud. Eddie comes up and goes, doo, 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 doo. it's like suddenly you've got this violin, like <laughs> amazing virtuosic. He's not hitting the guitar that hard. I was like, oh my God, listen to that sound. And a short side story on that, they had a Jeff Picaro tribute after Jeff had passed away. Sure. Um, sure. 
And this was, yeah, so Eddie was one of the featured guests. It was kind of Toto with a bunch of guests. I think George Harrison was there, Donald Fagan, a bunch of people came I, out on stage. I read about Eddie that in uh, yeah. Luke's book. Yeah. He talked about that, yeah. Yeah, okay. And so, man, you know, they're up there playing, and Eddie comes out, and I'm there with my wife because she was working at, uh, what was it called, you know, um, MCA Records at the, you know, sort of Universal Group, whatever, so we were able to get tickets, and we're like, yeah, this is going to be great. And so he comes out, they wheel this thing out, starts playing, and right away I heard that tone. I go, oh, my God, listen to that. Just It's like this soaring violin thing kind of. And I've seen them play a bunch of times live. I was a huge Van Halen fan That's cool. back in the day. Uh, I remember going, yeah, saw the first concert. We were in Murfreesboro, Tennessee or something, <laughs> Mid-State Coliseum. And it was a night off on the road with, with Barry Manilow, so it was in 80, 82, right in that period. And so our road manager was able to get tickets. And most of the people on that gig weren't that interested. I was going out and I'm like, yeah, we're going to go see Matt Hillen. <laughs> and it was a great show. The drum solo was amazing. They sounded really good. It was the original band. Yeah. And it was just so exciting. Lights and everything. And I was like, man, this is such a, a fun evening. You know, night off when we're doing our other stuff. So I've always been a fan of that sound. You know, these guys all make their personalities comes out. And so that was... And Eddie was cool. Then we ended up, we went and played golf one day. That was fun. He had this Are you and Eddie? nomad station wagon. Yeah, because uh, we were kind of hanging a little bit. So he goes, yeah, why don't you come up? We'll play golf. So <laughs> we're both kind of double bogey guys, That's pretty whatever. Cool. So we just went up. Yeah, I was kind of hanging out with Eddie. So then we did another benefit show. It was at the Hard Rock. I want to say it was, I forget where it was, Hollywood maybe? Or... And it was for this kidney foundation that Sterling Ball is part of the uh, polycystic kidney research because the youngest son, Casey Lee Ball, had some uh, health issues with that. So Sterling's been the, the point man. He raised a bunch of money for UCLA cancer research with that specifically. So there it was both bands. And so I got to hear Alex Van Halen was going to play. It was you know, Van Halen and then the Biff Babies. So he came in and he just brought his cymbals. He played my drums, wow. but he retuned them. It was interesting to hear the sound. Uh, and he was super cool, kind of standoffish a little bit. This is Alex, yeah, the yeah. brother, you know. And, but he was, man, what a powerhouse player. I've always been a fan of what he does, you know, just kind of emulate that approach to the music. Because there again, to me, it sounds like two guys. It's the brothers, just, you know, this thunderstorm of, of energy yeah, yeah. for both of them. So, and, you know, a lot of those early records were influential for me. When I always liked, you know, hearing their songs and guys were emulating that style too. So, it's, you know, melodic kind of, I don't know if you'd call it heavy metal or what you would classify it as. I wouldn't call it metal. I, I just Looking call it hard back. rock, you know? Yeah. I don't yeah, know what the proper, is, yeah. the proper so language I've, is. I'm, I'm like, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. guess if uh, maybe yeah, I was sorry. like, my parents might have called it heavy metal or something. <laughs> but to me, it was just hard rock, great yeah. hard rock, you know? Oh, so innovative. Yeah. So innovative with his sound. So, yeah, Eddie's great. I don't, you know, I haven't heard or stayed in touch with him. Um, at all, but you know, uh, he left the music man thing to go to PV. I yeah. think he had a signature model with the or you know, decided to go elsewhere, but you know, it was a fun little hang time and great to get a chance to play with him. Yeah, that's cool, and, man. Yeah, that especially that. I don't, I haven't heard if there's any bootleg tapes of that concert we did at the NAM show. I don't know if that exists or not. I've never heard anybody pull one out. Yeah, so yeah, John, what's, what's the most, yeah valuable things or what are the most valuable things you've learned from working mm -hmm. with all these top guys for so long um mm -hmm. learned about the music business about people or about yourself yeah. even yeah okay um several things i just you know kind of come to mind um i think one of the main things is not to be too hard on yourself and establish a consistency with your performance that gives you a level of acceptance for yourself. That say, okay, yeah, I played good tonight and it's okay. Or, you know, it's easy. I think I'm one that's always been sort of, you know, oh man, I didn't sound like that. Oh shit, I missed that. Like any little detail and then you get hung up on that. And the one thing I learned from my son with the sports we were talking about is, yeah. you know, we, we would go to these parent meetings because they would just be talking about, you know, being positive coaching and all this stuff it's like forget it next play you know like if you made a mistake that's okay next play you know just keep going rather than getting hung up oh my god i missed the shot i did this or whatever so just letting all that go and being in the moment um 
you know, consistency um, and the flexibility, too, that was required with situations where, oh, you know what, guys, we got bumped. It's a festival. We're not going to get a sound check. Okay, well, I can throw a tissy fit or just go with the flow and say, that's okay. We'll, we'll show will go on. Um, on a musical level, I think it's really a lot of these people, it's learning how to listen, you know, to what's happening and how to react and support that. And that's always a subjective choice, too. You know, you might make a wrong choice with certain people um, and or people want to direct you, too. I've gotten a chance on the 50th anniversary um, I think there's a DVD of this with the Ernie Ball Company. Mm-hmm. We had a bunch of the guys. Steve I came and played. Um, obviously, Albert Lee, Steve Morse, and uh, Joe Bonamassa was there, too. So he's a real dynamic blues guy. So I don't know his playing well enough to kind of be able to follow him, maybe. And he would like to sort of dictate it, you know, bring it up, bring it down. And so you just got to be watching and paying attention. That's one example of, you know, the flexibility and, um, and listening. Um, as far as biz stuff, I mean, you know, not being afraid to ask for money, <laughs> that's a big part of it. Yeah, that's huge. I'm <laughs> you glad know, you brought that up. Yeah. And it's an interesting dynamic because, you know, I think you get used to, uh, just playing little club gigs or, you know, undervaluing your skill level, but then sometimes you can also price yourself out of something. So that's, uh, it's a fine line, you know, when people say, oh, Hey, how much do you want? And it's like, well, I like, well, what's your budget? You know, what do you got? Because they might overpay you in some situations and other situations you go. So another friend of mine, bass player named David Enos, who's a wonderful player, played with Arturo Sandoval. We played together with David Benoit, pianist. Um, his thing is fame, fun. So you know, I have at least, you know, one of those. Yeah. So, you know, if you're playing with these big mean guys, but the fun you're getting paid or the fun factor, because we'll go do these jazz gigs, which barely pay anything, but it's a chance to play and really stretch out and, we're having fun and, you know, gratification. So that, that, that biz side of it, you know, some guys will get insulation with managers. I've always been asked, do you have a manager? I said, no. It's, and that was ironically what my wife was involved with uh, when she was, you know, working in the industry. That's how I met her. She was Larry Carlton's office manager. Karen. Oh, wow. Name. That's so, so cool, man. That's a good story. Yeah. 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 So Dude, she, you got a you lot know, out of working with... Of Publishing. Let me tell you, man, taking yeah. that freaking plane, like, changed your life. And every, that was the yeah. best, that might be the best decision you've ever decision. made in your life, man. Right. There you go, yeah. Seriously. I know you talk about, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, as far as the other parts of that question, people, life, yeah, it's just being flexible, um, how to, uh, you know, interact. And a lot of great players, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of a number of great drummers, but they're kind of a pain in the butt, you know, that they're not going to get the call because if you suggest them, even like if I can't make something out, Hey, I'm out so-and-so. Yeah. But he's got that weird attitude. I mean, Oh really? I don't know because I don't get to work with them. Sure. You know, they're much better technical players than me, but if people don't want to play with you and if they don't have that mindset of, I got to make the band so good as it can sound. Some of these guys are going there because they want to blow their chops and go nuts and, Sometimes it's not the right choice, you know, the right personality fit or musical choice fit. <laughs> so no, I, to- I totally it's, get it. It's a hard thing to put a finger on. Yeah, hard to put a finger on it. And um, the other thing that will happen with me, and I always hate this, and I purposely don't tell people if they're a stranger or a new guy, you know, especially a guitarist, because if I say, well, hey, I played with you, you know, start listing names, they'll you curl up or, you know, run off yeah, the stage. Yeah. It's like, no, man, I'm here to make you sound you know, if we get a chance to jam, I'm going to have fun playing with Craig, you know, with you. Yeah, yeah. It's not like, oh, I'm not as good as this guy, this guy, this guy. Forget all that. We're here right now. We're going to play the music together and, and make it as best we can make it. And that's important to kind of stay there rather than it's easy, like the ego attitude thing. It kind of ties in with that we were talking about. So I don't, it's just a ser- servant approach, you know, yeah, yeah. to the music and, uh, yeah trying to make the band sound as good as it can sound the right dynamics, the right tempos, the right feels, you know, a lot of little things that go into the, uh, the drumming part of it and, so, and the rhythm section. Yeah. The engine room. <laughs> let me ask you this mm-hmm. question because I have a lot of players listening to this of players of all instruments, primarily guitar, but it's the same question for yeah. no matter what you're playing. I can mm-hmm. see if you're playing at a certain level of club 
all the time. Then you get an opportunity to play with someone that's a bigger name. I can easily see how you could sit in your head and say, well, I'm getting so Mm -hmm. much more exposure. So, so let me not Mm -hmm. charge more money because I'm, I'm okay with this money because now I'm getting exposure. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, you know, I don't think at least the grocery stores here on the East coast do not take exposure for uh that's right for uh, uh, lunch for lunch yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah, you can't pay your mortgage with exposure so what mortgage what what advice would you give to them when it comes time to not under you know you know the fact that Mm -hmm. you're getting exposure is a mutually exclusive issue and when it comes down to it anybody that's a a big name artist that's going to sit and in their mind, approach your salary of, hey, well, you're getting exposure. They're kind of a dick to do that because that's not cool, you know, because yeah. they were at that level no, at some not, point yeah. in time. So how? what advice True. would you give to people that are having that dilemma? Yeah, that's a, a, a really tough question because it's, like you said, multi-pronged with the aspect of, you know, it's already starting off on the wrong foot. Like you said, exposure. Well, I'm going to get that regardless. Um I'm trying to think how to, to uh, the point. Um, yeah, because here's the other logic out here in Hollywood, too. I mean, you know, there's all these baby bands that want to play Sunset Strip or whatever. Yeah. So it's the, it's the pay to play mentality. And that can, you know, it's almost counterintuitive. Down where I live in Orange County, at least there are clubs you go to play and they'll pay you, which is great. Great. So as far as how to, to, to you know, sometimes you just got to bite the bullet and say, okay, it's a showcase thing. We're just going to go for it. And it could lead to something else, which is our, it won't. And like you said, that monetarily, you're not going to, because you're going in the hole. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you know, you're paying gas, gas and, you know, whatever expense to get there. Um, I guess it's just trying to get that business mindset and think about, wait a minute, you know, there's 500 people at this club. If they all pay the ticket price, you know, let's be entitled to, working a deal with the people at the door. Hey, can we get 80, 20 split or something? Sure. You know? And so maybe that does require another person to intercede for you in that sense, rather than, you know, the leader of the band, but most band leaders are, have had to deal with that. So I don't have a real good answer for it. Um, And unfortunately, you know, guys get pounded down and you just uh, don't get a chance to really, you know, make a living at it. I remember talking to some older musicians around Orange County and they said, Oh man, we used to make this money 30 years ago. You know, the $150 a night yeah, yeah. kind of mindset. But you know, that's when gas was 30 cents a gallon mm-hmm. and you know, uh, just the whole economic structure has changed, but now that gig still pays 150 bucks. So yeah. what are you going to, you know, it's like take it or leave it kind of thing. And it's hard to kind of catapult it to the next level. Um, maybe now with, you know, even like corporate sponsors or something or ways to cross platform or whatever you call it, you know, the, the terms, you know, with products or something or, Hey, we're, we're sponsored by GoPro or sponsored by this. We're sponsored, you know, so, uh, it's hard to find those kids. And then you've got like a lot of the, um, like summertime series concerts, which are funded by cities. Right. Like, look, we've got 10 grand we need to spend. So if you can tap into that and say, Hey, well, why don't our band go play and we'll get paid, you know, it's a power trio. We're going to charge them a thousand bucks or whatever. So at least sure. walk away with some stuff that it's, <laughs> but I, yes, I don't usually book bands myself. So I'm always the guy that's getting the call. And then it's, you know, asking the questions of like, well, you know, where is it? Or, Hey John, I love this call. This is something I had to learn. Hey John, what are you doing next Friday? And I'd be, Oh, look, my calendar, nothing. Oh, we drive to, Five dollars to like, oh no, and you know, you're up on the phone going, oh no, what have I gotten myself into? Oh, say so that I again, you broke up, learn, you broke you up know, for a second. They, they ask yeah. you, to, what do you do, and you oh, say yeah. nothing, and they say, can you drive a bunch of three hours? Yeah, or do you make, yeah, you make the mistake of somebody else, hey, Craig, what are you doing next Thursday? And then you go, oh, let me, you know, oh, yeah, it's open. Oh, good. Why don't you come do this gig with me that's two hours away? <laughs> And it pays fifty bucks or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's like, oh shit! Now, now my I'm anchored. So my next question is, hey, John, you know, what are you doing next Friday? It's like, well, I don't know. What do you got? Right. And then yeah, you get to it, tell. Yeah. They get to tell you. It's like, oh, you know what? I've got shoot. That's right. I got to go to the dentist that day. Or you can kind of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not like a liar, but you just say, oh, I'm sorry. I, you know, I have a prior commitment. Yeah. Because it gives you the option to say yes or no, whether you want to do it. 
And uh, that's that was a big learning curve. I would, you know, when I was younger in my twenties, would end up going on all these wild goose chase gigs. I would call them. It's like, shoot, why did I sit take this gig? I really don't, you know, this is taking you know, too much time. It's not worth it. The players are a little bit sketchy, whatever. So sure. that's a big plus in my mind to just kind of, you know, see what what's the scope of the job you're offering me, yeah, and then totally. I can decide whether I want to accept it. Or not. So that kind of ties into this thing, you know, like with the exposure or something. But then again, you know, there's those chance opportunities where you go there and someone in the crowd, wow, who's this guy? I've never heard of him. I'm going to hire him for this record. Right. So, it's, and it's always yeah. a, and, but the, I, you know, from what I've carrot learned, being dangled. Yeah. 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 You always have to, uh, <laughs> you know, the rule of thumb is say yes to everything in the beginning. And then you're going to get to a certain point where you don't have to mm-hmm. say yes. So I, and I'm, thank you for sharing that you, right. you, you did a bunch of crappy gigs yourself yeah. because, um, people oh, yeah. people don't seem yeah. to sometimes people think like oh he was just hanging around he wasn't doing anything and Larry Carlton descended upon him I mean that's not really how it works yeah. you know you just didn't bring up all the you know the sleep <laughs> you know the yeah. the driving in a van yeah. and sleeping staying awake all night or sleeping on the floor of a van so I, yeah. I mean uh, yeah talk, oh, talk yeah. about paying some shoes. everybody does man Excuse yeah. me. Talk about the work you do for Promise Keepers. It seems like that's a big part of your career and your life, actually. Yes, that was something that sort of through my wife Karen. Uh, we were that, this is our 25th anniversary this year, so dude, congratulations! This will help me with the time. Thank you. Yeah, that's so awesome. 1994. Is that the, is that yeah. the right math? Let me think here. Yeah, yeah. 94. Um, you were. Uh, through her and, you know, sort of getting reconnected with the church situation and then finding out that, wow, these guys, they have a band at church. I'm like, really? I've never been to a church with a band, but it's a large situation throughout mm-hmm. the world that you've got worship teams and yeah. things like that. So it's like, oh, yeah, we got John. Hey, why don't you come and play this weekend? We're going to do these songs and you learn them. It's like, oh, yeah, this is fun. Um, so that this Maranatha music was the the company that was hired by Promise Keepers is out of Denver, Colorado. I think. Mm-hmm. And it's a men's ministry movement. Coach McCartney was the guy that started it back then. And so Maranatha was hired as the uh, vendor, if you want to call it that, I guess, to provide music for the events. So they were looking for players and bands. And I got called to go, you know, be part of that. And uh, it led to a bunch of other work in that area, too, with different artists. And there's a whole world going on, you know, within that, as well as there are on Friday nights at a lot of the Jewish temples. You've got Shabbat services and things. So, yeah, it's not just Saturday night, the only night you can work as a musician. I've been lately been doing Friday nights and Sunday mornings, you know, to do the the the, the religious circuit, if you want to call it that. But, sure. you know, spiritual minded work and a number of different things. So that was really fun. We got to play these stadium events. One of the biggest gigs I ever did was in, I think it was 98, was this uh, Million Man March kind of thing. Sure. It was on, in Washington, D.C. So. That was pretty amazing to be part of that. It's, you can see it on YouTube and stuff, but it's a really nice day of, you know, services and different speakers and things. And yeah, it's definitely a, a large part of my life. And, you know, I have to sort of recalibrate your whole mind and spirit about, you know, what's uh, your priority <laughs> and things. So, yeah. Very cool, I, man. I like doing those events. I'm still involved in that. And, you know, try to help people with production too that are songwriters or encouraging people that are younger players to say, Hey, you know, like, why don't you come play here and call them into stuff? You know, it is, you take a professional ethic to that environment too. It's not like you're just going to, um, you know, cast it off like it's a goof off thing or something. But then again, you know, you'd be asked to play there for free sometimes and you get to decide whether you want to be a tie in to that too. Right. So, but most of them that I'm involved in, the people do have budgets, and so it's a nice blessing for our family to say, "Hey, I can go play this weekend at the church, and we're going to get some, you know, an honorarium." That's the word that you got to use for getting paid. You know, they, you know, just the terminology is a little bit different. Yeah, maybe. yeah. Well, it's good that you could do that. If you go in there with a, and that even those people sometimes will say, "Hey, you know, this guy's got too much of the gigging spirit." You know, meaning like it's just, "Hey, man, I'm doing a church." Oh, because you, another, yeah, you, know, you need to have club. some, yeah, yeah, you probably need to have some sort of a, I think, connection yeah. with that to some extent. Connection, yeah, yeah, I would imagine. That's so. true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, I do. I get something from it on a spiritual level and a peace. You know, that you walk away going, "Wow, I learned something today." The 
you know, pastor, preacher, rabbi was said some really neat things that you reflect on and apply to your life. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a bigger assignment kind of in a way, but it's also your being a humble servant to come in and, and play. I think it's like you anything know, else, man. You could take or not take anything out of something or, you know, I mean, if you want to take something out of something, it's up to you and you'll do it, you know, any, any interaction you have. Yeah. It's, it's your choice. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. When's your anniversary? Right. Just curious. Is it, is it June any chance? Oh, uh, June. Yeah, it is June 18th. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I think, is that the date? Oh, shoot. I got to remember. Hold on. Yeah. Mine's the 14th, is, man. Like... Mine's the 14th. 20, 25 years. Right same. Yeah, we've been together 26 oh, and a half. Oh, Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right just, on. You know what? I just said, I'm just, I'm like, God, how can I not have, I'm like thinking now, man, we got to go plan something. Yeah. That's a big one, isn't it? I know. It is, yeah. Uh, Karen's working as we speak on a trip to Italy in September. But um, we did this two years ago with another couple. It was really fun. We went to Florence in uh, Verona. That's cool. Ten or twelve days. So I had to sort of call into Bert's people to say, "Hey, are you guys trying to book any work around here? Because we're looking at, we're calling it our birthday slash celebration. Hers was the fourteenth on the twenty second. Yeah, man. In September, so." Uh, it's sort of a combination of yeah anniversary and birthday. <laughs> well, congratulations! That's <laughs> a nice. Two birds. For, Thank you. You too. Yeah, congratulations. Man. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. It's a lot My of it's, and people don't realize. I mean, we get along great, but it's a lot. You got it. Twenty five yeah. years with that's a lot of oh, work. People don't realize. Yeah, I mean, dudes. a lot of compromise, give and take. Is, yeah. You know, a lot of support, a lot of learning, a lot of growing. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's still ongoing. Yeah. Oh yeah. Talk about man. Um, yeah. You've done a lot of sync work and licensing. A um, couple of questions. Uh -huh. One is, yeah, I'm, I'm like such a fan of the Warriors. <laughs> what was that experience oh, like? Yeah. <laughs> what was Fraser like? And okay. how do you get a lot of those jobs? Yeah. I mean, I, I would assume you, yeah. it's like anything else, yeah. and you, you get one, and then they know about yeah. you. Boom. But you know, right. so feel free to talk on anything you want. Yeah. But talk about the Warriors. I love that movie. Sure. Yeah, okay, so the Warriors, I forget, that's early, late 70s or it, early 80s? I, I think. think it was late 70s, um, yeah. I, wanna, I think it could be early 80s. I was talking about this the other day. Yeah, uh, where was I? And the people were just talking about it, and it was kind of funny. I had brought it up, and I saw it on your uh, list that you sent me. Okay, so... Well, because it Newport took place, you know, they, 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 yeah. they, at the end, the meeting was in the Bronx. And I remember, because that was like a, and in right. this, in New York, right? Yeah. They had all you these know that. posters. Yeah. 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 And, and when the, they had all these, and I remember <laughs> I stole a poster off a bus and I had it hanging in my room. <laughs> That's awesome. It was, it, That's it was great. just so badass. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That movie was kind of not spooky, but it was like a little intimidating because yeah. we had no concept of uh, it you know, little Orange County kind of surfer, sure. you know, beach boy land or whatever. Um, so real quickly, I'll try to get to the point here. The, uh, the, the, the producer of that movie, I think it was a Spielberg movie, but Frank Marshall mm -hmm. and his wife, Kathleen Kennedy, um, were involved in that. So Frank's uh, younger brother named Phil Marshall, who's a film composer, okay. um, we got thrown a bone and said, hey, you guys, let's do a little track, like an underscore track for the movie. So we recorded it here at the local studio. And it's something that you goes by in maybe 30 seconds, you barely hear it. But, you know, it, it gives us all a credit to be part of the movie. That's um, so cool. Now, I'll tell you who the dad is, yeah, of, of both the Marshall family. His name was Jack Marshall. So Jack was a composer and guitarist, and he did the, the music for the Munsters. Wow. That's cool. So that just got recently relicensed with this song i forget the name of the band uma thurman you know she looks like uh -huh. or something so so because of the family estate and here again it's the songwriting thing that goes on for a long time if they own the rights to it they all got a big chunk of money because they were able to license that yeah uh so it's sort of a sidebar story with this licensing concept but yeah the marshall family they're really sweet and they're uh phil uh still around doing stuff and then there's another brother uh, uh matt marshall and um they all grew up on Lido Island, which is the same place where Sterling Ball lived, or the Ernie Ball family. Ernie was the dad. Right. They lived about two or three blocks from each other. And uh, Sterling would always hang out with Jack to talk about music, you know, and stuff. And Jack uh, worked with Howard Roberts, a number oh, of different, wow. uh, Shelley Mann, all these great, you know, 60s-based uh, studio guys. So I never got to meet Jack. He had passed away, but um, all his writing and music and stuff, and he was really... Um, 
you know, a big influence. Like, wow, here's this professional composer in our little hometown here. And their family, the legacy, you know, they've continued on in the arts and uh, music and film. And obviously, Frank's very successful big time producer. So, yeah, that was fun. Um, that's the, the, uh, the, what do you say, the Warriors. Yeah. So, the, the Frazier show is another dear friend named Bob Feldman, bass player. We had played together with David Benoit. And Bob had the job. It was, um, I guess it was Cheers before it was Frazier. Yes. And so, right. this was a yeah. spin off. And this it? was a situation. Yeah, at uh, Paramount Studios uh, in Hollywood. And so it was 26-week episodes, I think, with the TV season or whatever, 20-something. And so every Tuesday or three Tuesdays a month, we would go down there and play in the warm-up band. So this is what they do in between set changes, and we're playing music, and they have a comedian, and it's a very interactive thing, kind of a high-energy thing. So that was a lot of fun. And boy, oh boy, every Christmas, man, these people would hook us up with some amazing gifts, you know, from the cast and the everybody and the final season we all got to fly to hawaii for five days with our you know uh wow. life partner i guess that's the correct term to use now but you know i was married so karen <laughs> came and we were on gotta be uh, careful what, john call, someone's uh, gonna get pissed off yeah. whatever words you use don't worry about it <laughs> yeah yeah the, your, your significant other yeah, I guess, your is the significant way to other. correctly say it. yeah so they rented a private plane and we all jumped on the plane and we wow. were there for five days as like a final you know, send off party um, on the island of Hawaii. I'm trying to think the Mauna Kea resort or something, a really nice resort. So we got to play some golf and swimming and everything. It was really fun, relaxing time. So they were really, really nice people. Wow. And uh, it was always fun to hear the show and the cast, you know, the way they interacted. And so that was a good gig that lasted for about 10 years. There was another spin off from that called News Radio, which is another show that was on. Bob had the uh, arrangement with same production family. And I think there was maybe one other show. So we did that. And that was a fun gig. They fed us every time we went there. And, you know, there's something you would, wouldn't think of on a Tuesday night. Usually you're not yeah. busy doing anything. So it was fun and, you know, neat to be a part of that and watch how the whole production goes down with all the aspects of it, you know. And the actors were so consistent. You know, they would always be spot on with their lines and just really neat people. And, you know, some of them were approachable. You can go say hi or talk to them. But uh, sometimes they'd be in their character, so you don't want to disturb their concentration. So they so, had live they always music. The music too. They had live music. Yeah, in it's the called show. a warm-up band. Yeah, wow. yes. A lot of them used to have what you would call it a warm-up band gig. Now I think a lot of it's gone to DJ, which is cool. It's just a you know style. But then we would have. I think one of the shows had an actual big band. I forget which one it was. It was at a different studio, but we were hearing about some of our friends. were like, "Yeah, man, we're doing the." warm up and I forget what show but it was a full big band which is really exciting to have you know 15 or 16 guys up there horn section and everything but this was just a four piece band saxophone bass guitar drums or five I guess I'm wait a minute <laughs> four rhythm and the horn so it's five piece yeah so, Piano, so bass, it was like guitar, being in a pit like, it was like being in a pit at a yes play. Exactly. wow that's really yes. cool that's Every, right. so you yeah. had to be pretty fact, that was a like from a yeah. performance standpoint, yeah. you had no wiggle room there. You had to be pretty on top of everything. Yeah. Yeah. One of the routines that comedian like to do used to do was like, Hey, where are you from? Cause people would be visiting Hollywood and we'd get tickets to the show. So we finally got a big book that had country stuff, but then we would do parodies um, on it too. I forget what we would do. Some funny stuff. Uh, if somebody was from Maine or something, we, you know, we would do like Philly, parodies to it and then at the end we would play the theme song for the you know the Frasier show theme song which I think uh what's his name Kelsey Grammer had written the song oh really I didn't know that. something scrambled it yeah uh da -da 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 well, something about scrambled eggs or whatever it was a silly little song but that was our last song because then it was like that's our show and that was our cue we'd have to jump right in so those were fun gigs or live music a chance to hang out and uh, here, like I said, you know, we were we would just be used in between to keep the energy level up. And a lot of the cast dug the songs we would play. We could play almost anything we wanted. But we were doing like R and B stuff, jazz, you know, contemporary songs, yeah. but just with instrumentally. And no charts. You just come in and wing it. And like, hey, let's do a Stevie Wonder tune. Okay, this one, you know, somebody turned it off, or let's do a ZZ Top tune. It was a you know a wide variety of style. That's amazing. And then we play some jazz. Yeah, it was a lot of fun very loose you could wear whatever you wanted it would get cold in there so i always made sure i had a hat and like sort of a hoodie sure and we were up actually above the stage, like a rafters you know rather than being down in the pit we were way up in the back of the theater 
So that was fun. Yeah, the good times. That doesn't exist for me anymore. I mean, maybe there's new guys doing it. And the, I'll talk about Eric Pershing, who's the other guy that actually does the licensing with the uh, Spectrasonics. Mm. So those are the loop sample CDs. And he's got hours and hours of library stuff with a number of different performers. And so that's been a really nice, um, as you call it, like the side hustle. Yeah, for, yeah. Um, yeah, sort of a, a royalty-based thing, you know, quarterly royalties. So I think they're still getting used. People have there's a bunch of there's hours of drum loops and samples of me just playing. We did a couple of different studios, and I had about three or four different drum kits. They always call it the drum junkie because I've got too much equipment. <laughs> so I had all these different sets set up, you know, like a Bonham type of a drum set, a, a mainstream kind of pop set, a 70s kind of, you know, disco, do, 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 you know, Hal Blaine kind of a, yeah, yeah. you know, single-headed tom-tom and so we recorded all these different grooves and stuff, and that still pays a dividend for me. I get, you know, quarterly checks, and it's a, you know, nice little thing, you know, adds to the bottom line at the end of the month. Uh, where could people find yeah, those? Yeah, so I think it's Spectrosonics or Ilio. I forget the name of the company that took it over, um, but it's, um, I don't even know what the name of it is anymore, but a lot of it. Uh, if they look up know, John Ferraro drum loops, the keyboard, would they find it? Yeah, it should pop up. Yeah, okay. that, that's a good question, Craig. I should be more up to date on it. But it was the name of Spectrosonics was the company's name in another company, Ilio, I-L-I-O. But I think it's even changed um, since then. I haven't really kept up on it, but I always think of it as Spectrosonics. It's a, uh, Eric Pershing, who's an incredible creative mind, you know, keyboard player, and came up with this technology for the loops in the sounds with MIDI, I think, yeah. Well, don't so, feel bad because he's still you know, active. You never yeah. look at. Yeah. It's more important that the check cashes yeah. than who it came from. So I, I feel yeah. you on this totally. <laughs> yeah, and um, I mean, this, you know, because the drum machines first came in, we were panicking, going, "Oh, okay, guys, guess we're not going to be able to do this anymore." But I haven't noticed a big, you know, drop off. I mean, people like that as a style, all the electronic music, but they still are hiring real players to come in. Like yesterday, I did six tracks at Capitol. And about four of the tunes, I'm playing brushes and sizzle cymbal, you know, just awesome. items that are hard to replicate with uh, samples. There are some good jazz samples, but they want a real guy to be able to play, you know, <laughs> play for three minutes and we got a track rather than assemble stuff for hours on end. Yeah. And yeah. Having the program. And it's amazing how good the demos are. They had demo tracks. And I'm like, man, that sounds great. You should almost, and he goes, no, no, you can do better than that. I want you to play it live. Because there's some pretty good samples of stuff. I don't know who he was using for the samples. You know, there's libraries everywhere sure. now. That's a big oh, popular yeah. thing. And then, yeah, we did another project with another producer that does that named Steve Lindsay. Hmm. And Steve's dad was Mort Lindsay, who was the uh, music director from the uh, Mike Douglas show. I remember that name. <laughs> Way back and in I, the day. You know what? When you said that name, yeah. I, I remember that name. Yeah. 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 Mike Douglas. Steve's real talented, tender guy. And Steve loves like the retro sound, so he's got a lot of analog keyboards and stuff. And we're, he's done several of these library type albums. We did two last year. One was kind of a Weather Report inspired project, just original material based on that. And I got to play with Pino Palladino, who's a great oh bass, bass player. player. Yeah, yeah, uh, he, yeah, he's played with everyone, and he yep. spends part of the time, you know, here and and so that was fun. Just, it's, and that's kind of the same topic with the sync stuff. You know, they use it for uh, the tracks on that uh, Jerry Seinfeld as a cable show, or is it the uh, oh, comedians he's got a, and coffee? Yeah, cars. Or co yeah, something like that. Yeah, comedians yeah. And getting yeah. coffee so and cars do. or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's cool, right. man. So you know, they, they, that stuff. Like when you're hearing, you know, or ESPN, you hear all these stations. There's music going on underneath all that. Another dear friend I should mention is Daniel Holter. He's got a company, the Burst Collective, and that's in Milwaukee. So I, he used to fly me back there once or twice a year to play on tracks for him. So there's hundreds of these type of um, you, know, you know music library tracks that are out there as well. The Burst, and Collective. it's fun, you know, because it, yeah, yeah, he's a really good guy. He's got uh, with a Wire and Vice. I think that's the new company. He keeps sort of changing names. We're coming up with new projects, but he's very active. Uh, they have a really nice studio at the old post office in Wauwatosa, which is a suburb of uh, Milwaukee. That's cool. So we go back and we have a lot of fun, you know, uh, playing music, and he's always got a really good scope of things. Okay, here's what we're going to do today, and he's got a list, and then he stays right up on top of all the current bands and things, so he'll know 
sounds and he's got tons of microphones and really good equipment there. I just show up with sticks. He's got a really cool Ludwig set there and some DW drums and cymbals and snares. And, you know, he's a drummer originally too, but he got into the smart to get into the production side and sure. also the composition side. Yeah. So that's think that's a whole other world that people don't know about, you know, like young students. It's like, uh, you know, people are always afraid. And I get asked this question, you know, oh, you play it, oh, what band are you in? It's like the mindset of you have to be in a big famous band. There's so much of this work, as you said, with the session guys going on underneath, you know, the radar, so to speak. So I always tell people, look, if you own a, a television or a radio, you've heard me play hundreds of times. Yeah. Meaning it could have been a commercial, could have been a soundtrack, could have been one of these uh, library tracks on when you're watching the, you know, ESPN highlights or whatever. So <laughs> well, well, there is a career to be had with just like, yeah. There's, there's even, um, yeah. do you happen to know any of the national guys? You know, Jerry McPherson, guitar player? I know the name. Yeah. Um, I've only played there a few times. There was, uh, Rodney Crowell is a dear friend. He lives in Nashville. He yeah. hired me a few times. Matt Rawlings, who's a wonderful pianist. He played with Larry Carlton's band for a while. Uh, Michael Rose, the bass player. He's oh, a wonderful he's, player. He's, uh, he's with, amazing, that yeah, dude, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. I think he's he out with Bonamassa. He is, yeah. yeah. I just saw him a few months ago. They were through. Yeah, he's a great player. But uh, Jerry... Is, with those guys yeah and jerry's a fantastic player he's been in nashville 30 years he's a first call guy on guitar mm -hmm. and um he mm -hmm. plays he does a lot of work with facebook tracks chris like you know you could set Ooh. up a, a you know a, let's say oh. a, a, a yeah. bunch of pictures in uh making a you know um like a montage and mm -hmm. you can select music and he's the guy playing a lot of that music so there's tons of that stuff around you just gotta yes. you know it's like yeah. anything else man you gotta dig Make a little it. bit yeah and you got to yeah. earn it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Yeah. It's a, a <laughs> tough question. Yeah. If, if you can answer it. Top three musical experiences. Yeah. Just go by your knee-jerk <laughs> reaction. Yeah. Okay. I think I mentioned one earlier. It was the Promise Keeper DC event, which was, you know, <laughs> man people March. as far as the eye could see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess they called it that. So I don't know the exact head count, but there are some footage of it, and they're saying that, you know, it was close to that amount of people. Um, a couple of years ago, recently, was I got to play at Hal David, who's the songwriting partner with um, uh, Bert, Bert right? but he's yeah. passed away. It was his night. Uh, you know, a lot of those songs are written by Hal David, Bert Becker. Right. He was the lyricist primarily. Um, it was his 90th birthday party, wow. and it was at the Mark Taper Forum here in L.A., so we had a bunch of different guest artists that were all doing that material. And I'll, I know I can't remember all of them off the top of my head, but I remember uh, Smokey Robinson came in and did a really cool version on the piano of Walk On By. And ironically, Bert was in the audience. And so that was the night before I had my first rehearsal with Bert after I'd gotten hired to play for Bert. So these artists are all doing his songs with different versions. So the very next day I come in to play Bert's show, which is the way he liked to do it. My mind was blew up at the end. I was like exhausted mentally <laughs> because I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I just played that song last night with that guy. And he like trains in boats and planes was one of them that Dwight Yoakam did. Yeah. So of course he does a train, train, boat, train, but like boom, ticket, boom, like a country group. Mm -hmm. And it's so fun. But then Bert's version is really like a really specific part. Okay. So my mind's going, wait, I just played this song, but now I'm playing it with the guy that wrote it. So That's... that was a fun event. Um, and then I think we already mentioned the NAMM show with Eddie yeah. and those guys. That was a pretty remarkable thing. And another thing that was fun that I've done a couple of times, it was Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. for the ASCAP Foundation, which is, you know, the Songwriting mm -hmm. Society. And that's a show where they'll feature, they're there to kind of solicit support and funds from our government. Um, the band leader is uh, Chris Caswell, and uh, what's his name? Paul Williams, who's the songwriter, mm. you know, is part of I think he's the president of that. So we would back up all kinds of different artists. Um, I got to play with uh, the guy that was in The Rascals. The Felix, Felix Cavallari. Cavallari. Did you play with uh, Mark think, Prentice? Yeah. That sounds very familiar. That was his yeah. Mark I know played his bass name? with him for years. Yeah. He's out, and so is uh, Mike. Okay, I, think, I know his. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think who was the bass was Mike Seavers might have been guitar player for him. But I know. Oh, okay. M Mark, Prentice. this was a situation where we were a house band. Oh, you were yeah, the house band for these guys. Know, 
for the event, yes. So okay. Lee gotcha. Sklar was our bass player. Okay. So wonderful. Yeah, he's yeah. amazing. <laughs> he's a great guy. Oh, my God, yeah. And then um, I'm trying to think. I don't even know that we had a guitar player because it would have been some of the artists, like Ray Parker Jr. came in. And one of the guys that had written those songs for Harry Belafonte, I forget his name, his older, you know, six foot, seven foot, eight foot bunch, you know. Oh, they right, like, right. Um, and he's the guy that wrote the song. And he performed it. it was amazing, really sweet guy. Um, and then we had um, Monica Mancini was there to do some of the stuff that her dad recorded, uh, Henry Mancini. All these different artists, so just one or two songs each, so kind of not a variety show, but That's it was cool. in this little tiny concert hall. And so that was fun. I've done that twice. And then um, uh, that was, those are all some, you know, big, fun, memorable gigs. There's a bunch more, but those are the ones that come to mind, yeah. I'll tell you what, man. Yeah, you, yeah. Uh, so they had... You're very, <laughs> you're grounded. You're extremely grounded, man. I mean, like, you know, well, I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but, you know, you're, no. you're, 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 these are names that just an infinitesimal yeah. people get to play with and you're getting back right. ass over and over again, you know, and it's so, it's so, uh, right. You know, you know, it's funny because one of the questions people ask me, oh, do you interview, you probably have a lot of guys that are jerks. And I'm like, honestly, no, <laughs> I don't. You know, yeah. they don't, no, don't have a, a lot of egos. Yeah. I'm like, no, because you yeah. can't be an asshole. <laughs> and, yeah, and still do this. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just <laughs> yeah. you know, like and it, people are like, really? I'm like, no. I mean, I had a couple of session yeah. guys, young guys. Uh, just to yeah. clarify, you mentioned uh, uh uh, Andrew, Andrew Sinewick, he great, definitely yeah. was not one of them. He's great, um, but um, that were a little bit. Just they, they were just young, you know. They weren't even arrogant; they were just a little young. But man, yeah. you know, it's just so yeah. wonderful um, yeah. dealing with everybody because there is no. Uh, at least I haven't been exposed to very much of it. You know, everybody's very humble mm -hmm. and grateful to be doing mm -hmm. this. You know, if anything, yes, very good. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree, Craig. That's a good point. Yeah. Let me ask you this. That being said, if there is there sure. any advice you would have given to your younger self if you had to go back, like uh, advice? Uh, yes. Yeah. Where, what would you yeah, say? Where's, let me. Yeah. Let me just see here. I'm gonna look because I wrote some notes on this. Oh yeah. Take your time. Um, yeah. It's, it's on the back on page three, uh, number nineteen. Yeah. Is it? Uh, yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, definitely to write and produce and learn how to engineer and record because that's the new normal. You know, yes. everyone expects you. I've got a little Pro Tools set up at home here. And, you know, people want to be able to send you tracks and have you play on it. And then, you know, also it's an opportunity to be creative and say, hey, I can sit down and write a, a blues tune or I can write a song mm -hmm. that might get used on a movie or the sync thing. So, yeah, that's I'm sort of catching up to that curve. When I was at school at Cal State Long Beach, um, this would have been, you know, the early mid seventies, the computer thing was just coming into play. So sure. access to a computer, you had to like try to make an appointment and I was really not into it. I was like, wait a minute, just even learning the basic stuff. Sure. So my, luckily we've got, you know, the kids have shown us a lot. I've always called my yeah. daughter, Hey, how do I do this on the dad, you know, hold, command shift and you know, all this stuff. So I'm still getting better at chops on that, but I have a basic understanding of, you know, running pro tools. And learning more about that with production too, being around the situation with Sterling's project right. and being part of that. So, you know, that that's a really key element. I don't think you can just be a player in this modern society now. I mean, you can, but it's, you're taking a big risk as you're up against guys with experience yeah. as well as, but then the same is true with me was I've got younger guys who don't have the experience, but they got the current knowledge of the technology and so they're opening doors that I might not necessarily have direct access to. But I'm, you know, trying to be open minded and learn new tricks. The old dog's got to learn some new tricks. You seem pretty. Yeah. You seem very <laughs> open minded, actually. Is that? Are you? Oh, thank you. You you seem yeah. Are, for the most part, yeah, I mean, you seem like really open. -minded. Yeah. I mean, some of the styles of the music, maybe if I don't understand it, but then I'll be curious to say, well, how do they play in that? And now you're required too to play it live to replicate sounds. Yeah. So you know, I get emails every day from all the top, you know, drum channel and drumio and all these sites that have instructional videos. And it's fun to just check out what's going on with new guys or how they approach something. Some of it's like drum geek stuff. Other stuff is like, oh, wait a minute, that's a cool thing. I could use that, you know, in a creative format. So it's, yeah, you just got to keep growing and learning and be open-minded to it. And I think 
you know, knowing what you can do best and knowing that not, you're not going to get called for every single gig where you're the right choice. And you just, that's a, a pill to swallow too. I think young guys think I can do everything. You know, I can, oh, yeah. you know, just, you know, all the go the jokes about the guitar players, you know, how many guitar players have changed the light bulb and everything, you know, but <laughs> of course and, the guitar players are saying that right, about like, drummers, yeah. right? You know, yeah. that. <laughs> and drummers, yeah, the drummers too, Yeah, the drummer, you know, how do you tell them the stage and level, and the, you know, the drool coming out of the drummers <laughs> sound equally. And the That's funny. Stuff, I haven't you know, heard that one. <laughs> drummer without a girlfriend. Oh, what do you call a drummer without a girlfriend? Homeless. homeless. You know, just, yeah, yeah. I've heard that so, one. Yeah, homeless. Yeah, like in other words, you've got nowhere to live. But, um, yeah, the advice, I think, is just uh, be, you know, gather as much as you can info as a young player. and But you still have to have a skill level. There's a laziness factor that guys will talk about, you know, my generation of, like, you know, younger bands. And there's even a cartoon caption. Okay, guys, you know, they'll do a take. And there's mistakes and everything. Okay, hey guys, that sucks, but come on in. We're going to sample it and cut it up and paste it together yeah, with Pro yeah, Tools yeah. Right. and make a track out of it. Where it's like, wait a minute, it takes three and a half minutes to play a song. You should have a skill level where you can play with a click and lay it down. And most, especially drummers now, a lot of them are well-trained. And with all the schools that are out there, and like I said, the video information, you learn how to do that. If you're not, then you're going to be struggling you know, to be uh, competitive in the work field You know, if you're trying to do the session thing or being in a band so well you can yeah. you can cut and paste all you want but no one's buying records so you got to yeah. go out in the field and play to make money right. so i mean if that's you can't right. play you're not making yeah. money uh, that's true and i mean if you look at the band we were talking about luke there earlier you know toto has got a new resurgence i think uh, yes one of those bands did a couple and so they're always out on the road you know touring and they're very popular everywhere else in the world we saw them last summer it was a great show here in la they did the Pacific Amphitheater, it's right mm. on the corner from the Orange County Fairgrounds. It was a great show. So all live playing and everybody's got their shine and, you know, featured all the guys in the band. I was sitting right in front of uh, the Picaro family because Joe oh. Picaro is a legendary guy and his wife. And uh, we all got to go backstage and say hi because Sterling Ball, I was there with him and he's, okay. you know, got passes from Luke. There. So That's we had cool. a lot of fun hanging out with them. That's yeah, nice, Joe's man. a sweetheart too. He, iconic guy he's from connecticut so we always talk about hey oh, we're you ex -coms. Get here. did i throw that fun at you yeah but uh yeah it was really fun to, to hear joe and see everybody that was there yeah Very and then cool. they have uh i think luke with their son trevor you know there's a next generation wave yeah he was saying his kid, band yeah 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 so they're all doing but anyways i'll let you <laughs> get no no it's all good i do use T yeah. Tough question. What do you like most about yourself? Yeah. Very good question. Um, I think that I'm fortunate to have sort of a good uh, recall ability or oh, a memory. You know, God, my grandmother yeah. was like this. And that was a huge plus because she could, she was musical, but she was never formally trained. She came on the boat from Sicily, basically, you know, with just a suitcase and showed up in New York or whatever, you know, Ellis Island and they Ellis went Island, to Connecticut. Yeah. That was, yeah, so I'm second generation American, if you want to say, you know, so all the grandparents were born in the old country, as they like to say. So, but she had this incredible memory and she was very musical. She'd always be singing songs and she knew like, uh, oh, well, uh, Rosemary Clooney and stuff. And she would be singing all the time and very rhythmic stuff. And I would be paying, like, just captivated by it. But somehow that gene pool where, you know, the ability to like recall certain songs or tempos or things, I don't have perfect you know, tempo or whatever. But that's another Hal Blaine trick. I remember hearing an interview where he talked about, well, you know, to find the tempo for the song, just sing the chorus of the song, you know. So, you know, can't find me love or whatever. You know, yeah, it's like, yeah. all right, that sounds about right. Here we go. One, two, three, you know. So if you're not connected with the music or the lyric, that could be, uh, you know, if you're just, well, what do you want me to play? You know, a lot of guys will just sit there and they're kind of, they don't offer a skill like that. And he, we just lost him recently. Hal was just an incredible talent and musician and really forward thinking. When you look at, listen to the parts he played, you know, like he's thinking ahead of like, I'm going to put a tambourine. I remember the first time I met him was at an AM show and I went up to him and I'd been playing for Larry and like, and Larry, you know, played with Hal a bunch of the studio. And I said, man, you know, big fan of your playing. I love, you know, I just said something silly like, um, it, what's it? Everyone knows it's Wendy or something. Oh yeah, uh, by the, the association. association I think. Yeah, 
Yeah. And so the first thing he goes, oh, yeah, check it out. On that bridge, I go to this plane. this playing congas and tambourine or something I'm like, wow. You know, so his, his mind was like an advanced, like a programmer, drummer. <laughs> so he would shape the song in a way. And when you listen to the parts he plays, like, that's unbelievable. Um, you know, good vibrations and all that stuff. He's got this, boom, you know, like all these parts worked out. I'm like, man, this is like a guy that's programming. Yeah. Things parts but along with just being able to play a great groove and he said he was always reading music so you know like classical gas is like a really challenging song they just oh, come that's in a great and read song. it that's down really and talented that's yeah. really challenging and there's some you know, odd time things but anyways yeah he i just you know really appreciated the stuff that he his whole body of work is just a constant source of inspiration yeah so <laughs> i forgot what your question was no no it was good man you answered there. it no it was all good <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think the ability for me was like the memory. I think recall, it would be yeah, great recall. usually like the recall or just that. And then, uh, you know, just being not taking myself too seriously too. I mean, a lot of guys can get kind of pumped up about it and it's just, you know, being, you know, this cool, like you said, grounded, you mentioned that earlier. So I guess that, I, didn't, I don't think of it that way, but you're right. I guess there is. Just a, <laughs> I think that's so important to be Friendly like that, man, because you know, I, especially yeah. as you get older, you realize yeah. Anything yeah. can happen, and you know, get, you know, you, I'm sure you know people that have gotten sick. You, you could, you know, I don't yeah. care how much of a badass you are. Good luck with that when you get cancer mm -hmm. or when your fa something happens to one of yeah. your kids or something. You know, you, you're, you're not going to face oh, that because you're a, you're a great ex fill in the blank. That's irrelevant, yeah. man. You know, so right, that's true. Yeah, priorities are <laughs> yeah. yeah, family and important. stuff yeah, like the, that. The, the hierarchy. Yeah, totally. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> hey, two more That's questions. Right. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, toughest decision you ever had to make or most difficult thing you've had to do? Okay. I think I have a good... Yeah, that's 19 on the other page. Yeah. Yeah, page okay. Uh, this would have been 1980. I can tell you this. I remember the time frame because it was a choice. Um, at the time, I was, uh, you know, I'd been playing for Larry for a while. And I actually came home from that gig, and I remember being getting kind of depressed about something, or I think it was, something wasn't going right. And so I was so into just drums, 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 you know, just doing that. And I've been a, you know, sort of an athlete of sorts, or not really. I just enjoyed, you know, like shooting baskets. I'd come home after school, go shoot baskets, and then practice just to kind of get some energy out. It wasn't that good. I wasn't I'm not that tall, but. And I also like ice hockey. I like to play. So I still go. In fact, I'll probably go later today to stick time and just go skate around and shoot the puck. Very cool. So um, Very... where this is going is that then I got invited to join this, the Ernie Ball softball team. So we're, uh, it was fun, you know, because Sterling's there and a couple of the other guys that worked. And it's just an adult, you know, rec league for the city of Newport. So we're there playing. And one of the other Ball brothers is David Ball. And he is a cyclist and a soccer player. He pretends like he's Italian, so he's into all this, like, hey, Johnny, you know, he's always like me, whatever. So he's a really funny guy, but he had struck up a friendship with Alan Holdsworth. Alan had just moved kind of to the West Coast of L.A., and Alan was a cyclist, too. So they show up at one of the softball games, and they're on their bikes. They've got their little costumes on and everything, and we're just got done. And he goes, hey, John, it's Alan. I go, yeah, I know who he is, of course. It's amazing. <laughs> he goes, hey, he's kind of, I'll to talk to you because he's auditioning drummers. And I'm like, wow. Holy okay. And they just had that album that came out with Gary Husband. And uh, there's a singer, I forgot his name. But those guys had to go back to England. So he was still here. So long story short, we end up, he goes, yeah, come on up. We're going to go to this warehouse. It was up in Fullerton or something. And I think, wow, you know, I've heard this record. It's pretty remarkable stuff because Tony Williams had used him on his records, Alan, and, you know, all the brand X was like amazing. So, we go to this rehearsal, and it's just him and me. We're playing, just kind of jamming, and I'm just like, going, oh, my God, this is like a, you know, amazing stuff. And he goes, okay, great, you got the gig. I'm like, really? It's like, And I didn't understand the music. I really just didn't understand. In my brain, I was used to hearing, you know, a verse, a chorus, a this, sure. kind of the structure. And at the exact same moment, I had gotten the call to do the Barry Manilow thing. Uh, so it was kind of a tough choice. And I'm like, oh, man, what am I going to do? Here's this world-class guitar guy. And, you know, just like, but I just didn't know what I was supposed to actually do playing-wise. And I thought, you know what? I think Manilow, yeah, I, I know what those songs are. I can, I'd probably be better suited if I did that. So I called Chad Wackerman and said, hey, you've got to come check out 
Holdsworth gig, and he did, and he got the gig. He's a perfect choice because he could really understand all the uh, complexities of that. So um, it was fun. Uh, but I think it wasn't necessarily a tough choice, but it was just kind of like weighing on me, like, man, what should I do? Should I pursue this, you know, super arty kind of style of music or not take the safe choice, but do something that's like more in like, I guess you'd call the fat part of the bat. You know, it's like, yeah, okay, yeah. I know I'm going to, you know, well, it was more nail your... this. Yeah, that's a tough yeah comfort zone or well, just more. Yeah. If, if like I understand yeah. what you're saying, you said yeah. I, I, it's yeah. almost like you probably said to yourself, "How the hell did I get this job?" Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's if it's not if yeah. that's not your thing that you're listening to, it's almost like well, yeah. you're you're waiting for like how can how does this? It almost doesn't mm -hmm. you know make sense. So I, I get that, man. Right. Yeah, it was just something, and you know, the body of work. I mean, like, here's a big tour, which economically, too, back to the business side, it's like, okay, wait, I can go make this chunk of money, or kind of see yeah. what might happen with this situation. And there wasn't like any tours booked or anything, yeah. so it was. On one hand, it was kind of an easy decision. But yeah, yeah, it was sure. hard to say. Well, shoot, I want to challenge myself as a, you know, an artist or professional or you know, creativity. So I think I made the right choice. And then Alan was always super friendly to me. I'd always see him, you know, come to gigs and very humble guy. Now he passed just recently too, yeah. unfortunately, but what an incredible body of work he's had. And yeah. uh, they did a tribute for him last year. I think Chad was there at the baked potato, which is, right. sure has been mentioned on the show many times with oh, the yeah. guys, the guitarists. But yeah, so that was kind of, you know, not a turning point thing, but I just, you know, said, no, I want to kind of stay in the mainstream, if you want to call it that, with the Mandalore. And that's, we went all over the world with that tour. It was amazing. Got to play in South Africa, Europe, Japan, Australia, all over the States twice. And we were doing these summer shed tours. I guess the Nederlanders owned all these theaters. And so we played. And the cool thing about that is you were talking about the Yankees earlier. We'd always get tickets because they were part owners of the Yankees. Oh, really? So we got to go to Chicago. Philly, oh, that's we saw cool. the Yankees, uh, the White Sox. Yeah, we went to all the stadiums because we'd have a night off. And then we had a softball team, too, so we had our own little Barry's Boys. <laughs> we had these jerseys and stuff. So everybody in the band would play, and we just played a local crew that's and nice. hang out and, you know, have like a afternoon, you know, session and drink in a beer or two and just kind of relax. But, yeah, that was fun. No one got hurt, thank goodness, because uh, we would have to do the show. <laughs> who, who was his guitar yeah, player at that time? Was it Mike Lent? Yeah, was it? a guy named Art. No, but I know Mike Lent. He's yeah. a dear friend too. He's from Monterey, California, and he's a great, really good athlete too. He's a tennis player, but he liked hockey yeah, he too. We always talked about ice hockey. Yeah. yeah, and so he wasn't on it when I was doing it. Um, the guy named Art Phillips, and Art lives in Australia now, and he's been there for a number of years, and he does a lot of music library productions and stuff. And the bass player was a really great friend. That's how I got the call. Was the bass player Leon Gay or G A E R? And Leon had played with uh, Don Ellis Big Band, which yeah. was all that really complicated time stuff. And was that drummer a... was Ralph Humphrey. Who, okay. Yeah. Was he a trumpeter, Don? Ellis? Uh, Ralph. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I believe so. Um, but he had written all this really hard music. And Leon played in that band. And Leon was the bass player with Manilo. And he was great to play with. Really supportive and really funny guy, too. We got a lot of fun. Uh, but Ralph Humphrey and Leon had played together a lot too with all the odd time stuff. And I studied with Ralph. Ralph's a great player. He's he's kind of under the radar too. A lot of people really need to know about him. He's played for everyone, you know, in LA here. Uh, what was the Dance with the Stars? I think he was the drummer on that show. Oh, cool. And a number of different scenes like that. And also uh, Al Jarreau. There's a couple of tracks he plays that are really cool on those records. So, yeah, all these character you know just part of the community i'm very fortunate to be <laughs> you know had this opportunity to meet and play with a number of different people and you know my mentors there's tons of them the guys that i'm still meeting and getting a chance to learn from all the time so yeah <laughs> it's fun yeah last question man and i can't thank you enough for your time i've really yeah. enjoyed talking with you You're a class guy thank you. um likewise thank, thank you, you. Biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years, John, and how much of that has been intentional and how much is just a natural process of mm -hmm. aging? Right. Um, I would say just trying to be, you know, uh, obviously the physical change and appearance change, which can influ influence the higher ability factor, because I always think about that too. Maybe it's my own self consciousness. I'm thinking, wow, who wants to see, you know, this bald guy with glasses up there or whatever? But you know, if they're listening with their ears, so behind the scenes, it's not so much of an issue, but it as a chance to be in a band, you know, on stage performing, maybe it's an issue, maybe it's just my own head. 
So that does enter it and um, just be, part of it, not even professionally, is just trying to be better at the parenting thing that we talked about earlier with, yeah. you know, kids, even though they're it's not a challenge, man. 20, you, so. think, you think it's yeah. over and it's like, oh, yeah. God, I need yeah. a, I, you need no. like a time yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. So it's been fun. I mean, we're technically empty nests because they're both out of the house. But so, yeah, it's almost like it's a rediscovery of, you know, uh, with Karen and myself, just spend more time together and also to kind of keep that love affair going with the music kind of that childlike enthusiasm to try to maintain that. Cause I'm noticing not that I'm not being challenged, but I feel like, okay, I need to dig in here to something new within what I'm already doing and refine what it is that I do best or, you know, that I enjoy playing and realizing, look, I can't play speed metal, you know, with double kick drum. That I'm not going to be the right <laughs> guy for that. You know, there's other guys that can do that. And I know with guitar, it's kind of that heroistic thing. So um, I'm not sure if I'm staying on your question as far as that, but I think some of it, like you said, is, is not deliberate or uh, how much is this part of aging yeah. in this. Um, but just accepting the fact that, look, I'm not going to be able to play every single gig that I might think I could have or want to be challenged with, you know, from 20, 30 years ago. And it's part of it's the physical aspect of it too. Like I've gone to see shows like a Ringo Starr show, for instance, Greg Bissonette, who's a dear friend, great musician, great energy level. <clears throat> and he's up there, man, he's pounding it out for about, you know, almost two hours, hour and 40 minutes. And it's high level energy. And then it's so fun when you hear him play it along with Ringo or, you know, he's a huge Ringo fan, Beatle fan. So the two of them together when they lock in, they're just smiling. And I've gotten to see that show now and it's really fun. So wait a minute, Ringo, uh, Ringo then, you know, has like the an, another, yeah. dr Greg's on that yeah. Ringo gigs. I didn't, so it's two drummers. Yes. Oh, I didn't know oh, that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Greg does plays, plays the entire time, and then Ringo will jump in and play some of the songs together. And then Ringo's up front singing, and then he'll come back. He plays one song, he plays piano. It's a fun show. And another friend is on, you know, Luca Thur does that gig, yeah. too. He does and, it, yeah. uh, it's like the all-star band. So he, he changes the lineup from time to time, but... Greg is just nailing the heck out of it. I mean, there's great footage of him on, you know, you can watch videos and really admire, <clears throat> you know, his work ethic and what he does um, playing wise. And he's been very kind. He sort of turned me on to the Boz Skaggs gig. Uh, that was something that came through him okay. and his brother, Matt. Yeah. We can talk about that maybe on the list, but that's, yeah, that was, and people got a lot of response on that because there's a, that live DVD from uh, 2004. I remember people coming up to me around Christmas time later when it came out. They go, hey, I just saw you on at Best Buy. I'm like, what do you mean Best Buy? He goes, yeah, they're playing this cool DVD with Boss Guys, and there you are. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. That's so I get more comments about people seeing it at a retail location. Yeah. Does he ever play that song? So Man, that my fun. favorite Boz Skag songs is the one that Dwayne Allman, I think, played guitar on, you know, Loan Me a Dime. Oh. Yes, we did. And that's so funny that you mentioned that because I sort of wasn't aware of his body of work prior to you know, the lowdown and that album that had like basically Toto, you know, the band. Yeah. So all that stuff, and this is Jim Cox's on the gig too. So Jim was on that and Jim was a huge fan prior to all that. He goes, Oh yeah, we're going to do this song. Well, me a dime. Like what's that? You know, I didn't even know what it was. So I had to go back and listen to some of the songs to learn them. But you're right. Yeah. That's uh, some of Boz's earlier stuff, real blues. Oh. Heavy, and it's great. Yeah. Who, it's who's on group. guitar on that yeah. gig? <laughs> uh, th when I did it, it was Drew Zing. Mm. He was a New York guy, I think, but I think he might be out in California, I'm told. And then the other guy was John Harrington. I oh, yeah. I know John. He from, plays. He, he's Steely with Steely Dan. Dan. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He was cool. So I Another did New York that guy. one tour. And then, yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. Then I, they asked me, it was a last minute add on because uh, Kahari Parker, who was the drummer that was supposed to go on tour with them to Japan, but couldn't get the visas straightened out with some situation so they're like hey can you help us we need you know we're going to japan can you come with us so that was a different band that played on the dvd band a couple of the same singers but um different rhythm section and that was a lot of fun so we did those blue note circuit in japan you do like two shows a night like four, four or five nights a week and then you go to each city trans you know travel to so that was an interesting experience as well to get the, you know, do a vocal act. Cause normally when I do that tour, it would be with uh, Larry Carlton. It would sure. be all the instrumental songs. Obviously Boz is going to sing, you know, most of the night, but there, you know, he let people play too. And John was great to play with great sound. He was kind of cut from that same Larry Carlton ish yeah. kind of cloth, you know, 335 and a lot of the same bending and stuff. And it's cool. Yeah. He was cool. I haven't stayed in touch with some of those guys, unfortunately, but you know, they're, 
on the other coast, I guess. But, you yeah. know, it's fun to just remembering all these different people that you meet and trying to stay in touch with them. Well, ma- <laughs> but it's possible. I just say, you know, not actively on Facebook, like checking in daily, like sending people notes. Yeah. But if you can do, yeah, you know, they're just a phone call or a text away too. So it's, yeah, man. Yeah. You know, social Te- media. Yeah. Mm-hmm. John, mm-hmm. let me tell people yeah. some of the stuff yeah. you got going on, what yeah, to look out for. Honestly, thank you very much for everything, man. Okay. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate all your stories. Thanks for your time. Um, Mutual Admiration Society. Talk about that because you yeah. guys are going in to do a second yeah. record. Yeah, that was came out last year. It's just sort of a labor of love, fun project, mostly cover tunes. <clears throat> I think there's one original tune on there, and it features a number of different music men and Dorsey guitar players, along with, I think, a couple of guys like Steve Vai and uh, Jay Graydon are on there as well, but like Albert Lee, Steve Morris, Steve Lukather, John Petrucci. Um, am I missing anyone? I think that's it. I hope I'm not missing anyone, but yeah, those guys are all affiliated with the company with yeah. Honey Ball, and they have signature music man guitars. And then, um, let's see, another friend is on bass, on the Slap bass. His name is Brad Heyman. This is another side band project, a group called Slap, <laughs> S-L-A-P. And we play around town. It's just kind of a psychobilly or rockabilly project. It's just a lot of fun. And those are all original tunes. I don't even know if you can find that album anywhere to be sold, but we have CDs of it. So that's a fun project. And Brad came in and played on uh, Memphis, the tune, you know, Memphis, yeah. and played the slap bass. And another good friend, Dave Stone, played the upright bass. His dad was the bass player on the I Love Lucy show back in the day. Wow. So he's like a second generation uh, musician. He's a top call symphonic player for all the. Um, Michael Giancchino movies, he gets called to be the, the section leader on string bass, bowling and stuff. He's a great jazz player, too, and plays all styles. You ever, um, you ever play with so Dave Rowe? Yeah. The, no, I don't know Dave. Yeah, I oh, haven't. Another yeah. Na- Nashville cat. I don't know, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah the cool. Nashville thing is sort of hit and miss. Um, what was the guy from, uh, was another guitar, John, oh boy, I'm trying to his name. He's got glasses, but he had that, the Helicasters. Oh, John Jorgensen. Um, John Jorgensen. Yeah, yeah, I had him on the show. He's out in California. Yeah, yeah, we've done some sessions. Yeah, he is. Yeah, so he he was sort of national based in L, you know L.A. Um, but anyways, yeah, the, those are the, the Mutual Admiration Society, and then uh, and you and you can yeah, the tour in Europe there. Yeah, and you can find that Mutual Admiration Society. They have a Facebook page, so check them out. Um, yeah, you're doing Europe. Yeah. This summer with Bert, you're going mm-hmm. to Germany, London, Ireland. And when will you be there? June, July? Uh, the Netherlands, yeah, it's uh, July 5th through the 28th, 27th, Great. actually, yeah. So, 26th, I think, is the last concert. But yeah, Glasgow Festival. And then uh, I think if you go to his site, it's called um, House is Not a Home. I think it's Bert Bacharach. If you just look it up, it'll direct you to the site, which has some of the live dates. So, yeah, it's. <laughs> very cool and also you got uh i was very happy that you you do lessons and if you're interested in hanging yeah. out with john and getting just you don't even have to get lessons just pay him and just let him talk um because he's <laughs> got a lot of interesting stuff to say <laughs> it'd be worth it if you're a drummer <laughs> seriously just ask you questions yeah. i mean just you know um yeah. and uh yeah. best best thing to do to connect with john is on instagram and it's uh Jack J A C K go wild. Jack go wild. J A C K G O go wild. Yeah. W I L D on Instagram. So just uh, yeah. follow him on there and, and yeah. message him for uh, less. It's in person lessons information. So if you're in the L A area, yeah. And crank tones, talk about that. Yes, yes. Uh, we usually do annual gigs in December, like Christmas concerts, Baked Potato, and the Buck Owens uh, Club up in Bakersfield, uh, Crystal Palace. And uh, but we're going to go into the studio in October. It's the musicians. Oops, I got to get Sweetwater Music. Excuse me, said the other company. Musicians Friend is another thing. But it's Sweetwater Music. They have a studio there in Fort Wayne. Yep. And Carl's been there several times to do clinics and record some stuff. So he was able to book some studio time there. And we're going to fly in and do uh, two or three days of tracking. And that's mostly covers. There might be an original or two, but it's just a fun bass blues band. It's got two guitar players, Carl, we mentioned, Brian, Craig Copeland on guitar and vocals. They both sing. Jim Cox is the pianist and the great drummer, uh, uh, Chad Wackerman, and our dear friend Tom Child on bass. 
And another Six great drummer, band, John Ferraro. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. And Me, myself, and I. There yeah. you go. And when is w- yeah. so that'll be actual a- a record coming out? When will that be coming out? Yeah, yeah. Uh, good question. Probably the first part of next year, because I don't think it'll take that long. It's pretty much live performance based. Right. You know, it'll just be tracks and then get it mixed. And I don't know if there's an actual deal in place, or maybe this uh, Sweetwater has a label. I'm not sure the details of it. But Carl's usually pretty good at organizing the the biz side of it. You know, yeah. to get it out there. And you know, it'll be a boutique kind of a. I think I remember listening to one of your other podcasts. You're talking about the calling card thing with a. Uh, uh, listen to Andrew. Sinewex thing and you're talking about oh yeah the calling the card yeah, yeah, yeah. The his yeah. record and was that's great, I, I like man. to think of it that way. yes it is he's a wonderful talent i've gotten to play with him several times really nice guy too yeah, really really fun. Nice guy. but um yeah this crank tones thing due to people's schedules and even with the mutual admiration thing everyone's got their own band so they're not really yeah. able to join forces to do a tour of sorts but the crank tones in theory we could do some gigs you know and uh Carl's always booking his band, the trio, yeah. all over the world. I think he goes to Europe quite often. Yes. <clears throat> the rest of the guys, Jim Cox, I think, is out with um, either Mark Knopfler or um, Lyle Lovett. So he wow. does those two road gigs. And then Tom stays at home, primarily Craig's around town. I do the Burt gig. So it's a little, it's Chad's always doing, Chad's plays with James Taylor. So uh, amongst other things, he's got some other um, really fun projects he does. So it's hard to get everyone's schedule and then line it all up to do so normally December we block out two or three dates so we can all play together at the, using the baked potato and like I said the uh, Crystal Palace. So I'm duplicating my info here, but yeah, very cool. <laughs> Thinking out loud, yes. No, it's all good, man. Yeah. John, thank you for everything. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you. Really, really yeah, nice my talking pleasure. with you. What a privilege. I love your site and what you're doing, man. Keep up the good work. It's great, interesting interviews, and it's really classy. So thank you. Thank you. I Privileged. appreciate that. That's the first time I've yep. ever been called yep. classy. Don't say that too many times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell my wife I told you that. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And actually, happy anniversary. Yeah. We oh, man, happy anniversary. Yeah, yeah, we got mutual anniversaries yeah. coming. That is pretty yeah. – I got to – I, like, write a yeah. note. I got to get on that right away, figure something out. Um, oh, I know. It. It's, it's coming up. Yeah. It's cool. you know, by, before you know it. Less than – yeah. For you. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this yeah. interview, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks to John Ferraro for spending time with us. Che- if you want to check out John, uh, it's John Ferraro, F E R R A R O. He's out on tour right now with Burt Bacharach. If you are listening to this and you're in uh, the England, excuse me, in uh, Europe, Germany, London, Iceland, or the Netherlands, check. Check out Bert's show. Say hello to John. They'll be touring there this summer. Crank Tones with Carl Verhagen. Uh, if you're a drummer and you want to sit at the the foot pedals of one of the greats, hit up uh, John <laughs> on Instagram. His Instagram uh, name is uh, is it name handle? I'm like thinking it's a CB handle. Yeah. Uh, his I Insta- know. <laughs> yeah. My age. His know, Instagram. Too, yeah. Yeah. His Instagram name is uh, Jack Go Wild. And check out the Mutual Admiration Society. They have a Facebook page, and uh, that's just a bunch of local LA guys having a great time. Make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list so you and I can connect. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Yeah. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. Amen. Okay.